So I start jerking off and there's pepper spray all over my hands. <laughs> and now it's all over my dick. All right. And my dick is on fucking fire. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. This is going to be the third big wig interview I've done. The first one was episode 11, where I interviewed Tom. The second one was episode 58, where I interviewed Josh. Now, this is episode 88, where I have interviewed Matt Gray. Now, if you want to learn about the band, you can go back to Tom's interview. And just the beginning of that, I do a recap of who Big Wig is. I'm guessing the majority of the people listening right now know who Big Wig was, or basically is, because they still play shows. But even if you don't, this interview is going to still kick ass, because Matt is basically his own entity. And this is this interview is fucking hilarious because he's just got these amazing stories. So I'm going to keep this real short because I want you to get into this interview. But I'm going to briefly just tell you what we talk about in today's episode. Matt dealing with seizures, breaking his femur at a show. The story is fucking gross. His journal that he's kept every day since 1997. What the second van was that I talk about in the Tom Petta interview. Getting scabies. Having a seizure during a show. The mixing of the drums on Stay Asleep. Their song, Friends, the Ataris, getting kicked out of the band, the starting line, the tour with Gob, and a ton more. Now, real quick before we begin, I just want to give a little love out to 88 Fingers Louie, who had their van broken into over the weekend or last weekend. So they are raising money to cover the costs for the shit that got stolen and for the van that got broken into with the smash windows and all that stuff. If you'd like to donate to them, you can just go to thiswasthescene.com slash 88fingers. It's 88fingers. And I have a large button there that basically just links you right to their GoFundMe page. I'm also going to put a link in the show notes if you want to click on that. They're about, I think, a thousand bucks or so, maybe 2,000 bucks away from reaching their goal. So if you want to help them out, that's great because, yes, sadly, even a band that's been together for 20 years can still get their shit stolen, which is just fucking lame. So you should go do that. And if you want to support the podcast, you can become a Patreon member for just a dollar a month. It just gets taken right out of your account with you not even thinking about it. I've said this many times, but it's just like buying three and a half cups of Starbucks coffee this year so if you want to skip out on three and a half cups of starbucks coffee this year that would just go to uh the 12 dollars total that you'd spend on donating to the podcast so if you want to do that you can go to this was the scene.com and there is a button on the top for the patreon page there's also a donate button if you want to do that and that's all i'm going to say feel free to subscribe leave a review and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia with that said let's get started just just to let you know, I'm on uh, medication for my epilepsy, and they've changed it. So please, if I talk over you, please, I'm sorry. I don't mean to talk over you. My brain goes sometimes quicker than my mouth or, or vice versa or whatever. So just to let you know. Yeah, no, to it. What, um, what do you want? Because my dog, I, obviously, this is a big difference. My dog has had seizures all summer, and he was on meds, but it turned out it was actually – he has an autoimmune dis- disease or something, and it was causing inflammation in his brain. So oh, I'm so we, sorry. Wow. We, well, but we put we put him on prednisone, so he hasn't had one in a month, which is the longest he's gone. So it's like, okay, well, we found the thing. But he's now. I'm very educated now in seizure meds. Like he's on sure. potassium bromide. He's on three right now. He's on Keppra, potassium bromide, and zinisamide because he's on. Kepra because they're trying to get him off zinisamide, and I'm like, guys, can we start pulling back on this shit because he's just a zombie right now. You know what? It's it's really scary because, uh, in all honesty, like the last four months of my life has really been uh, it's been a shit show health wise. Um, I, rec- I received some bad health news. I don't really want to get into it too much, you know. Okay. But like with the epilepsy, they changed my meds. I was on Dilantin for 29 years, and then they were gonna try Kepra, but they thought Kepra might be a little too, um, like you said, become like a zombie on it. And yeah. um, I'm on something called Vimpat which just did not work for me. I mean, it was, uh, you know that V8 commercial where the guys walk in like diagonal? I don't no. know remember that commercial. No, I've never seen that. Okay. Like, I just feel like out of sorts, almost like outer body experience. So the last couple months, they've been cha- changing me over to a Lamictal, I think it's called. It's funny because my wife is so much better at these words. <laughs> so... But it's it's been kind of a shit show at the Gray Residence, but thank God I'm getting back on track as we speak. So I didn't know you had seizures. Um, yeah, I've had them ever since I was 18. I've oh. had seizures 30 years now. So is it very is it like public knowledge or is this something that's not um, public knowledge? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Most of the time, um, I've had seizures 
on stage actually uh, oh, a few shit. times with with big wig and everything what oh yeah i've never so, heard of this yeah are we recording right now i don't even know yeah we are recording oh we're on we're up and yeah. running okay yeah well that leads into some of my big wig stories with having seizures wow. and and everything so okay well um okay well i, I mean, you know anything you don't want to talk about obviously you don't have to but i have a feeling that you're a person who's i'm an open about, book i'll yeah. talk about everything i appreciate that i'm the same way so i appreciate when i find someone who's like i don't give a fuck oh yeah i'm 48 now everybody should know you know all the names have not been changed to protect the innocent no way <laughs> You know, we're all older now. We all did things that were like, ah, oh, man, I shouldn't have done that. I could have done this better. We live and learn, you know, and pass it on. And, you know, I tell my kid, you know, like, you know, st- stupid little things that I've learned just to, I don't know. All right, man. Well, let's uh, let's start this off because I'm sure you have plenty of stories. So, you know, the structure, it's go back, talk about what got you into music, what got you into punk. Let's uh, we'll go into big wig and we could talk about some roadies or uh, you were more, you were roading for bands or you were drum teching for bands. What was um, after? Well, and well, what it was like, just just like real quickly. We don't, I don't want to get into the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet, okay. But... I mean, first we'll start. I mean, there was big wig. I was in big wig for seven years. And then after Big Wig, I became a drum tech for the Ataris, and I did that for like two years. That was it. And then after that, I became a drum tech for the starting line, and I've been with the starting line since 2005 up until present right now. Oh, shit. I thought there was like other bands that you were... Did you ever jump no. on other tours or like play... Because dr- there's a couple times I've seen you put videos recently where you're playing, you'll jump in for a set, right? Um, that was, that's fast forward all the way to recently, the Warp Tour, last Warp Tour show, and it was an honor, and I was at the right place at the right time, and, um, I mean, we could start with that, I, uh, I was, uh, we were on the 25th anniversary Warp Tour, with, you know, the starting line, and, um, some 40, we had played, and I had all this time to kill, so some 41 was on stage, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna watch some 41, and I was like, you know what, man, I really gotta go get food, and I love some 41, I'm a big, huge fan, so I walked back to the dressing room. I walked in the dressing room and our, and our tour manager's like, hey, do you know any no effects songs? I was like, well, yeah. And I'm like, and they're like, you know, cause he didn't, you know, he, we, we hired him for like two shows. He didn't really know me or anything of my backstory. And uh, he's like, cause no effects is late. They're stuck in Montreal and they're flying out to here now. And I think we were in, where were we in California somewhere. And long story short, I played a song with Kenny from the starting line, which was just an honor for me because I love that guy. Kenny is 100%. That dude is amazing. Love him. And, um, oh, God, the guitar tech for another band, and I can't think off the top of my head. Sorry. So we played a no effects song. We did Don't Call Me White. So then I stayed on the drums, and we did um, Bruise, and it was me, Kenny singing, um, Mike and Tyson from All American Rejects, the dude from Atreyu with the beard, I think it was the drummer, and Sergio from Quicksand, Deftones. Jesus. Um, and it was just like, to me, it was just like a completion of what I have, I don't know, just, just fought for. It was great. Um, and at the last, I don't know if you know that song, Bruise, there's like, there's a stopping point, and then it starts back up. And, um, it was so look stage because the last 10 seconds of the song, who comes storming the stage, but no effects come storming on the stage. So basically we had to kill time in order for no effects to fly into California and uh, other bands did it too. You know what I mean? But it was for me, it was cool. Cause it was like, I was the second to last drummer to play on warp tour. And for me, that was an honor. Jesus. And was, yeah. And it was great. I go to Kevin, I go, I know these two songs. And I go, please i'm begging you don't take it from me he's like they're yours don't worry about it you got this um and then some 41 wanted to know if i knew another song because it was going to be all them but their drummer was on like an important phone call and i was backstage i was trying to learn it and um uh they called me and they're like don't worry about it the drummer's gonna do it and i'm like okay and i'm kind of glad because he did a better job than i would (laughs) have oh wow yeah he's a great drummer so jesus christ that's crazy man so that's kind of fast forward into what just kind of recently happened that was over the summer so let's okay so let's go back in time a little bit here to kind of lead up to that because i mean it seems like that was like from playing for so many years to get in front of like how many people did you do that in front of 
That was like fifteen thousand. <laughs> did you? Yeah, it was. It was cool. Did you guys ever have that big of a crowd with Bigwig? Yes, we did. Actually, okay. we did. Um, of course, the typical Canada thing. You know, Bigwig always going to Canada, and um, I'm sure Tom will say. You know, and and I heard in your interviews, and I'm going to correct a couple things that Tom said, which is pretty interesting here too. Okay. Um, not in a bad way. You know, Tom's <laughs> probably shitting himself right now. No, not in a bad way. Um, we did. Um. One of the warp tours we did up there was like we did like in front of 25, 30,000 people. And it was great because uh, Chris from Less Than Jake comes up to me. He starts rubbing my shoulders. He's like, It's okay, Matt. It's only like 25, 30,000 people. You're okay. And I'm like, Oh, I'm so freaking nervous. You know, here I'm used to doing the hall shows that we all love in Jersey. And it's like, Okay, now you're up against 25 to 30,000 people. You know, and then years later doing shows with like the Ataris, we were in front of like 60,000. And I'm like walking out on stage. We did a show in Germany with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Wow. And I'm putting set lists down. And all I'm thinking, this stage is this huge. It's this huge, humongous stage. And all I'm thinking is like, don't trip. <laughs> I can't trip in front of like 60,000 people. That would really not be cool. <laughs> Jesus. But that was me drum tech. That, I wasn't playing that show. You know okay. I mean? But it was cool. The place we played there was like an old, it looked like an old World War II, like Nazi death camp. It was creepy. Where was, that, where was that at? Somewhere in Germany. I can't Jesus remember. Jesus Christ, that's um, crazy. Yeah, it was, like I said, I, I've got a lot of uh, quick, quick stories. I don't want to take too long with every one of them, but no. You know, we'll, anyway. We'll, we'll, <laughs> well, let's go back. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of lead back up to that because I think like as soon as we get into you being in the band and stuff, you'll have like some like more stories to dive into. But like, let's go back in time into like, you know, start off like what got you into music and what led that to like the whole punk scene, like the love and punk music for you. Um, for me, it was, of course, always rock metal. And then, um, I went over to my friend's house one day, I was in ninth grade and he played this band called white flag, not black flag, but there was white flag and a New Jersey hardcore band, very small band called mental abuse. And I was like, what, what is this stuff? And then, you know, and, and I had heard the clash and the Ramones, you know, when I was like in middle school, cause my brother's older than me. He's like six years older than me. So he introduced me to some bands like that. And then I found the Ramones and I'm a huge Ramones fan. And then after that, um, a lot of hardcore came into my life and I became definitely like a part of the whole youth crew 1988 scene where, you know, we could see how many stage dives we could do in like a two minute hardcore song and just pile on top of everybody and just have fun with it. You know, I, Roger from Agnostic Front used to say, first came the hippies, then came punk, then came hardcore. Yeah. And and I kind of agree with that. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a, a transition of sorts. Because, I don't know, punk rock to me was, um, you know, I was not really a, a, the drunk punk type guy. You know what I mean? I was more of a positive, uplifting. You can tell him. I'm a sociable guy. I You're a pretty positive guy. Like, it's pretty. Uh, yeah. You've always been that I, way, from what I've seen. I don't yeah, I don't care who you are, what you are. If I have time and I want to talk, I'll talk to you. <laughs> you know Did you mean? grow up that way? Like when you were a kid, because you, you have a lot of energy from what I'm just from knowing you, seeing you play, seeing the way you play and just just talking to you in general and watching your videos where you're playing drums now and things like that. Like, and you do have a positive energy. Did you have that much energy when you were a kid? Yeah, it was way worse. <laughs> I was gonna say it must have been I've like ki- like a times a hundred or a thousand. I'm, I'm a I'm pretty hyper. I'm pretty wired, and it's funny because I'll go into this like big week. All used to think I was on drugs and everything like that, and and I wasn't. I'm just a wired dude. Like I love cats. Cats are my thing, and they make me hyper to this day. Cats? I have two cats, and they drive me nuts. Yes, I grew up with cats, and I know I'm not they, a dog person. Wait, but, they make um, you hyper? Oh yeah, I'm weird. <laughs> Wait, yeah. Explain this. Why yeah. would they make you hyper? I don't know. They're, they're <laughs> cute little face. They're whiskers. Um, uh, yeah, awesome. they shit in the house. Well, you know, obviously in the litter box. But right. um, you know, I don't have to worry about you know if I'm at like a friend's house or if I'm at a show or a family get together. I don't have to say, ah, oh, my wife Becky, we got to go home. We got to let the dog out. That yeah. was never my thing. Yeah. And she's a big dog person. She had a, a Great Dane that lived to be 13 or 14 years old, oh, wow. which is a long time for a Great Dane. And um, I remember when I first got with her, we would have to go home and stuff like that in order to take care of the dog. And I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, this is pretty difficult. But yeah. um, Yeah. So I was always uplifting, pretty positive, hyper. And uh, 
It sounds like you like your know. freedom. You like your freedom to do the things you want, even though like being married and having being a dad, obviously, that, you know, your oh, that didn't hinder you from being free. But there are certain things where you wanted to be out, and you had all that energy. And you're like, I just want to be out and about, and I don't want to fucking pause this to go be responsible for a dog. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when I first got with my wife, it's funny. Cause I was like, listen, I don't drink that much. Cause my wife does not drink at all. She's not like straight edge. She doesn't, you know, no labels or, you know, shit like that. Yeah. But it's like, um, I'm like, I got to go out at least like once a month just to get it out, get, get it out of my system. <laughs> and she's like, Oh yeah, whatever. You know, at this point it's funny. I don't go out as much anymore. And she's like, get the fuck <laughs> out of the house. <laughs> Go Please. go release this out there in the world, and then come back and be like, okay, I'm back to normal now. Oh, I drive her nuts sometimes. She's like, oh, Anakin, your dad's having a having a moment, and I just like, I'll still jump on the chairs and on the couch and on the bed and just do front flips onto whatever. <laughs> yeah. So weird. so, do you think that that energy when you saw these bands or heard this music, you were like, I can connect to this because this seems like a release. 100% I fed off of it. Um, if I may going into the whole big wig thing, when I saw the first time I saw big wig, it was, um, I went down uh, from Pennsylvania with a couple guys with, um, an awesome band wisdom and chains. And we went to go see big wig at the pipeline. And I know Tom was talking about the pipeline and thing he he did yeah. lovely Newark, New Jersey. Yeah. And, um, they were playing with the vandals. And let me tell you, I stood there and I watched John, bounce around and he had that cool pogo happy bounce yep. and josh would just thrash around and tom was just jumping in the air as high as you could see and 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 mike i was like i want to be in a band like this i want to be in this band you know what i mean and were you and, and, but at this point though i'm going to cut you up because i do want to get back up to that but like leading up sorry. to that in so you were listening to music were you obviously well i'm, I'm where are you going to shows at this point prior to this? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I started going to shows when I was 15. Okay. Um, I had some pretty bad experiences I can talk about really quick. Um, yeah. I broke my collarbone stage diving. <laughs> and then two or three months later, on the same spot on the dance floor, I snapped my femur. Jesus Christ. And I have a steel rod in my leg to this day. And... Coming into the seizures four hours after I snapped my femur, I started having seizures. Really? And I just found this out about two weeks ago because my parents don't really know and don't remember because this was 1990. Um, my sister told me she thought the reason I have epilepsy is because when I snapped my femur, some of the bone fragments got into my blood bloodstream. That the doctor said that that happened? Yes. I guess the doctors had wow. told my parents that, and then my parents told the rest of my family. I mean, I don't know. I was in the hospital for two weeks and oh, had to shit. go through surgery. And then I, I ripped my contacts, and I'm blind, so I couldn't even watch TV. Like, literally, a foot in front of my hand, that's blurry. So I'm, I'm ridiculously blind. And then I had to have a hot, beautiful nurse <laughs> give me an enema. <laughs> And how embarrassing, you're 18 years old, and this beautiful nurse comes in. She's like, well, we've tried other things. I'm going to have to give you an enema. And I go, I am so sorry. <laughs> but all I was thinking is like, fuck, I can't see anyway, whatever. <laughs> so that's just real quick. There's a, I'm just going to just chime in on that, just being embarrassed. So sure. I, last year, I was having some issues. I was like... I was like, oh, I feel like a little maybe prostate issue kind of happening right now. So I go to a doctor and do all these tests. And he's like, you should go get an ultrasound on your balls, basically. So I go to this thing and I walk in and it's just this girl who's probably in her late 20s. And she's like the one performing this. So I'm sitting there on this table. Oh. And she's like, all right, now lift your penis and just pull your balls out. So, and I'm sitting there just having a conversation with her. And she's just like putting this ultrasound like all over my balls. And I'm like watching a screen. I'm like, what's that? What's this? How are you? And I just like totally just blew it by. But I'm going, wow, this this girl is just like just – just, this is normal for her. And I'm going, okay, I guess totally. if, you're, if you're in the medical industry, that's just like your jam. But if it's your first time and you know, if you're that, or if you're 18 and you're getting a girl to shove something up your ass, so you can shit. It's a little new. Yeah. And, and I was, and everybody knows I was known for getting naked all over, all over 
uh, all over the world. <laughs> and you know, when it comes to something like that, just things get a little weird. So you know what, I mean? how, what show were you at when you broke your femur? Um, it was a Murphy's Law show. And it was the first band called Lost Generation. And it sucks because I wasn't even slamming or, or stage diving. I was just standing there watching the band. And um, I got ran into and I went down and um, I grabbed some, some people. And I'm like, my leg's fucking broken. And I'm screaming. Nobody can hear me. People are slamming, stage diving, going nuts. Jesus. And um, so somehow they picked me up. And there was the cool thing. Well, the funny thing is this is in Connecticut. So I'm 18 years old, lied to my parents, and there's like two or three carloads. We drive to Connecticut to see Murphy's Law. Oh, no. So my my two girlfriends that I was with, um, they they dragged me to the back room, you know what I mean, to get me out of the, the melee of all the shit. And and my leg's flopping around, and it's flopping around. And I'm on thinking, I look back, and I'm like, who the fuck is kicking me? And it wasn't anybody kicking me. It was my leg flopping around because there was no, it wasn't attached to a fucking bone. Oh my God. Ugh. Oh, so I did it. I oh. did the back room and my leg is like swollen to like just ridiculous, gnarly, crazy, huge. And the cop comes in and he's like, welcome to Connecticut. I'm like, thanks man. Oh, you know, he's like, yeah, ambulance is on his way, blah, blah, on their way. So I get to the, I get to the, um, you know, emergency room guy pulls out a drill. I go, what's with the drill? He goes, you need to close your eyes right now. Oh my God. <laughs> he took the drill and drilled through my knee to get me set up for traction. Oh my God. And let me tell you, holy freaking, uh, gnarly. Why uh, didn't he numb you? Um, well, no, they did numb me, but you can still feel the vibration going through your whole, oh, leg, oh, your whole okay. body. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, no. It's like a I World War medicine. One scenario yeah. where there's like no, bite no, down no, in this no. or a uh, Revolutionary it, War. Bite down in the stick. I didn't make it sound that bad. No. Okay. But no, you don't understand. You still feel it. You ever had a bone drilled? No. Oh, uh, it was, uh. you know, so they had to do that to get me set up for uh, traction. So this is about one in the morning, whatever. And um, so the, the, you know, ER doctor calls my parents and Mr. And Mrs. Gray, your son sustained you know, broken leg, he's going to need surgery. And they thought it was a joke. They thought it was a prank. Oh, no. <laughs> Obviously not. So they're, they're driving two, two and a half hours to Connecticut at two in the morning. Like, sorry, I snuck out. And now yeah. you have to pay this medical bill. <laughs> and 60, now I'm going to throw 60 some, it was a 28 foot bill. I measured it and it was a uh, 60 some thousand dollars. Oh my God. Yeah. I actually thought it would have been a lot more, but the steel rod is still in my leg as we speak. Well, at least they did a good job. You know, yeah. how many decades later you just didn't yeah. play drums. Were you playing drums at this point? No. I mean, I was playing drums in like smaller hardcore punk rock bands. But I just started... in general, were you playing drums like you knew how to play drums? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, not as well. I was just, I was trying. I, I started taking lessons when I was 21. Did you pick drums again, just going back to the whole energy thing? You know, I'm guessing, did you ever like skate or do sports or anything to have just that release? Uh, no, because I, I, I grew up in the country, dirt roads. You can't skate anywhere. Um, in fifth grade, my mom goes, you should play an instrument. And I go, what? She goes, you should play drums. I said, okay. And then, I, you know, I never practiced. And I was in like the, the concert band and then when I got into high school, I actually put my drum set away in middle school. And then I saw, when I was in ninth grade, yeah, I saw a band called Corruption, great thrash band uh, from, you know, like Pennsylvania. And they played a couple songs and I went home and I grabbed my drum set out of the closet and I never put it back. No shit. Yeah. What Interesting you... story how I bought my first drum set. Yeah, tell it. I was an extra in a, a movie and nobody knows of the movie. But Marissa Tomei was in the movie, and it was called Playing for Keeps. Yeah, and it was filmed. It was filmed in my town of Holly, and my neighbor was one of the the film guys on the, you know on the production crew or whatever. And he told me to try out, and I went and tried out. And you you know I was in like it was funny because I I was in seven days of the movie, and I got paid twenty five bucks, and I legally was allowed out of school. And with that money, I bought my first drum set. <laughs> Yeah. I'm looking this up on Google right now just to see. Playing for keeps. Yeah. It's Marissa Tamei. She's got yep. this amazing 80s hair right here. Oh, it looks like. She was, 
gorgeous back oh, she was then. So hot. Oh. She's still hot. She's like, she's still, she's yeah. still a beautiful woman. Yeah. But it, I was, I still have her autograph. I still have it. <laughs> I have everything, Mike. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Cause you keep a journal and we'll talk about that too. You've kept sure. a journal just in general in your life, or you kept a journal just through the moment you started playing in bands every day. Um, 1997, I started my journal and I have not stopped and I just still did it last night. So it's every, every day, day, just person. No way. So if you want facts, I got them. I, you had <laughs> mentioned that down. to me when we, <laughs> when I ran into you at the Di- right. Jefferson Diner before we played the Lane Myers show that weekend, you, I was like, I, th- you should be on the podcast. This was back. This is a year and a half ago. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, I have a journal. I've kept it every day. I'm, I'm like, what? You're like, yeah, I, I keep a journal every single day about my life. What made you start doing that? Perfect question. Um, I, I started in Big Wig in 1996, and we started touring. And I started playing all these shows. And for me, I had put a good 11, 12 years of my life into playing in shit bands and playing with shit shows and carrying drums up and down stairs and in and out of shows and clubs and dropping a bass drum on your chest while you fall on ice, which is a which hurts. Yeah. <laughs> and I finally get into a band that I really, I love. It was my heart and soul and we're touring. And I'm like, you know what? I need to document this. I need to write all this down. And 1997, I started. You know, I think either it was you or somebody had mentioned when we started touring, it might've been uh, Heiner who was in Landmark at the time. He, someone said that you should journal. So I started doing that as well. And it was very like, cathartic or therapeutic or whatever but i remember my my girlfriend at the time she found it when we were back on we were from tour and i wrote this one scenario this one instance where we played the show in a house in front of like nobody but they lived next to a strip club so we ended up going to the strip club and i got this really lame ass lap dance and this is like 19 year old me I think it was like this, this girl's like first week on the job or something. And I was like, I wrote, I was like, this was so lame. Oh, and then man. I was like, and I wrote about how I was questioning my relationship. So I ended up going, Oh no! Yeah, so she, <laughs> she come, she was over that summer. I was, and I went out to get food or something and I came back and she just wouldn't talk to me. I go, what the fuck? And she, I think I might've said this in one episode and she just threw my journal at me. She's like, I can't believe you wrote that yep. and stuff. I go, and I said, honestly, like, you shouldn't, that's what you get for reading it. (laughs) Like I had no remorse. I was like, well, it's a journal that's mine. So what you read, what you find out is, you know, what you found out. So I don't have to tell you. Yeah. I've lost quite a few girlfriends that way. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, well, being in a band, you know? Yeah. You're like, don't don't fucking touch the journal. uh, Obviously, that was years back, you know. Yeah. Okay. So go back. To, <laughs> you go back to the the big wig show. You you go there. You go to Pipeline, which was off of Route 53, I think, in Jersey. I think it's. I don't know. This is where Rob Hit was telling me. He always yells at the the radio or wherever he's listening. To this. He's like, No, this is the true fact. I'm gonna open this up and actually find it. But yeah. So Pipeline was a big venue back then. It was super small and in just some shitty ass part of Jersey. And you go to the show, and that's when Dan was drumming. Correct. I and because that's why I, I think I mentioned in Tom's interview, I was so confused when I saw you guys play because I looked at the CD and I was like, "Yep, that's John, and that's Tom, and that's Josh." And I was like, "I was like, did this guy grow his hair?" I was like, "I thought his name was Matt." And uh, so, like, you go there, and he's in the band. So, like, how did you go from wanting to be in the band and then actually getting in the band? full story with that is um i was playing in a band and tom came to see me play and i'll never forget i was standing uh i was sitting excuse me on a a bar stool and he goes he's like hey my name's tom i play in a band called big wig and he's like would you like to go on tour with us to japan i go uh yeah he goes well i'm here to see you play tonight and I'm like, well, yeah, you've never even heard me play. And he's like, well, that's why I'm here. And he watched me play with this other band. And at the end of the night, he gave me his number. Give me a call. We'll talk things out. And it skyrocketed from there. And, you know, what happened was he called me and he's like, we're playing with the Vandals. You should come check out the show. And I was like, OK, is it cool if I bring my my dad's like VHS recorder to the record that show, which I still have, of course. Oh, wow. And he's like, yeah. 
you know, he's like, cause you know, that way you can see how our drummer plays. And I'm like, yeah, man, absolutely. So me and a few guys from like Wis- wisdom and change, we, we get in a van or whatever. We cruise down, we check out the show and, and I was just blown away. You know what I mean? I oh, really yeah. was just like, this is, I was really thankful. I got to be a part of that. And like, you know, I mean, blood, sweat and tears with that band, all of us. Yeah. I mean, it, I really think we had a cool, uh, you know what was really cool? Like Tom and I still to this day, and I know for a fact, like Tom and I had our huge differences. You know what I mean? We fought a lot, blah, blah, blah. But there's no denying that Tom and I, we know where we are whenever we play together. And when I did those few shows with him a few years back, it was great him telling the band members, just follow Matt. He knows what I'm going to do. I know what he's going to do. And I felt really good about that. 15 years later that Tom felt that way. Interesting. Because we really, and, and this is no joke, I play with a bunch of guitar players, love them all. Tom and I, whew, wow. Uh, and Tom and I could write a record in a week. <laughs> Did you, that. is it, well, Tom is, he was very metal uh, yeah. like with his guitar playing. He's like the solos and things like that. And do you think like you were in a really harder band? Do you think it's like how you guys connected just from that love of just that harder sound because i mean the first big rig big wig record is very fat record sounding you know very catchy and the second one started getting a bit harder Uh and so and that's when you came in so the first one's with dan and then he leaves and then the second record stay 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 awake stay Stay asleep so the second record stay asleep um it obviously got harder and then i remember when i told tom the first time i heard you guys play falling down I, that's one of my favorite songs because it was so just hard and it was just like a hardcore sounding yeah. band. Did you like bring – like would Hell you, yeah. You, okay. So oh, okay. Yeah. you brought that to There's it. a big difference between um, on American Melodies, which I wanted to name the record <laughs> just to let everyone know. They weren't into it. And I was like, you know, on American Melodies doesn't sound good. Because <laughs> here's what happened. The drum tracks were already recorded when I was in Big Wake. And they were practicing at my house. We used to practice in my parents' basement. A lot of those songs were written in my parents' basement. Hence, first song I wrote with them, 1-800-WIP. Really? Falling Down, yep, Falling Down was probably a second or a third song that was written in my parents' basement. Um, And I said, I'm like, well, when do I do the drum tracks? And Tom's like, you don't understand. The drum tracks are already done. We're going back out to California to finish the record. I'm like, okay. They're like, there's no reason for you to come. The drum tracks are already done. When we get back, we'll hook up, we'll start playing shows. And that's how that went went down. So in essence, I could have played on on Merry Melodies, but the drum tracks were already done. I was wondering why What and Hendra Whipped was just on a comp and then it yep. got re recorded to put on Stay Stay Asleep. Yep. That so, was me. Both versions of one eight hundred whipped is me, and both versions of falling down is me. There's two different versions of that too. But I felt like one eight hundred whipped stayed the same sound as it, it fell right in line with uh, Unmarried Melodies. I agree. I agree. Yeah, that was the first song. Like I said, Tom and I. I'm not too my own horn. I'll say it. I have nothing to hold back. I don't care. Yeah. I feel that Tom and I arranged. I'm pretty good even still to this day that arranging a song, I had the ability to do. Um, I'm not as good of a drummer as I used to be. You know what I mean? That those days are long gone. Um, but I had like Tom would come up with a riff and I would record it on a cassette player and they would go back to Jersey and I would listen to it. And I'd call up Tom and I'd be like, listen to this. We need to do this. We need to do this. I didn't do anything with lyrics. I don't understand lyrics. Not my thing. But when it comes to arrangements of songs, I was always kind of on point with that. So, So, and, and Tom even said, when I did those shows, he's like, just don't forget. He's like, you help create these songs. And it was good to hear him say that too, that he recognized that. Yeah. Why did, why was Dan's picture in the artwork for Unmarried Melodies? Cause he was the drummer. But he's... the picture and Unmarried, yeah. Cause when you lift up the, the CD, Dan's picture was in, cause he, re- I, I had nothing to do with that. I was just in the band touring off that record. How long was he in the band? Um, I don't, that would be John, Josh, a Tom question. I mean, I know you already interviewed Tom. I mean, because Big Week was a band for probably two years when I, and then when I got it, you know, and then they did the couple of their, I listened to Tom's thing and everything. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I had the second van. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. I was like, I, have, I knew they had two. I was, I was gonna, I brought 
so I have this 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 uh, word or this note. God, Mac has notes or uh, text edit. So I have text edit, and I every single interview I make a duplicate of the previous interview to keep the questions, and I have them in front of me. But then with this one, I went back to Tom's, and sometimes I'll go back too. If it was an Asian man, I went back and like found like a record label one and did that. So with this one, I went back and opened Tom's up, and I had it in front of me, and I saw, and I remember that I asked him about the vans, and I was like, I know there was two fucking vans there. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, and I have a flyer for that show. It was the Bordentown show you were talking about, right? Yeah, it was us, you guys, Boxcar, uh, Speed Bump, and Shower with Goats. Like Shower with Goats played last, and but that was the first time I met you guys and saw you guys. And it was I was like, wow, they have two minivans. Like they're touring with two minivans and they're all stickered up. Yep, that was my van. Yes. Yeah, that was me because I would come from Pennsylvania, do the show, and then drive all back way, all the way back to Pennsylvania. Oh. Yeah. So you guys didn't tour with the two vans. You would just no, no, show no, no, up no, and no. go home. No. no. So that's why I just wanted to kind of, you know, when I heard Tom's interview, it was like, yeah, no, that was the two vans was fine. You know, and I understand why Tom didn't really get that right because he's probably thinking two it's like, vans. We right. He's like, we vans. toured in you it. But that, mean? Yeah. That'd be like me playing a show and then Barker showing up in his grand, 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 grand prix, whatever his car was. And uh, yeah, like just showing up there and then leaving. It's like, wow, you guys tour in f- four cars? Like, no. <laughs> nice. Do you know a story about that show with Boxcar? And you might have to talk to Derek about this. I think that's the show where they had a tapped keg in their van. Oh, yeah. And they got pulled over, I think. Is that is that the show? Because I, I, I think we went to a party. Actually, I hooked up with a girl that night. <laughs> and I think we went to a party. And I, for some reason, I thought they got pulled over. I just remember they had a tapped keg in the car and in their van. I'm like... Man, you guys are ballsy. <laughs> they did. I talked about that in the interview with oh, okay. uh, with Brendan and with Chris, and I and I said we were talking. This this show has come up on so many episodes, like when the first be- when the podcast started, and I said, didn't you guys have a keg in the van? They're like, oh, because it was like a brown van, <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, we they were just drunk at every fucking show and just all the time. I remember like one time we were partying years later, and then Derek showed up. He's like, yeah, I'm just like not drinking i'm trying to just you know cut back or not and i was like but that's like your thing man yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i was like probably 20 or 21 maybe when i saw him doing that i was like whoa like that's like the that you're in boxcar like you guys get hammered like that's, that's like the whole that's the way it goes down um so okay so um, you so we go on you're gonna say something oh no i'm just, i'm glad uh, i'm glad that's with big wig i'm glad that was kind of like a a staple rule like nobody really drank before we played because yeah we wanted to have high octane high power and we wanted to get up there and we wanted to, to fuck shit up and and your interview with i think it was monkey by the way monkey was the fifth beetle yeah he was the fifth big wig member yeah without a doubt he was there with us for everything um joanna hackett we owe her so much so much joanna for hold, holding the glue together when we were uh, recording Stay Sleep. That might be another conversation, but I just wanted to shout out to them. Oh, we I love talk. them and we'll thank talk. them. Yeah, we could talk about um, them. That's... But um, and, but anyway, we didn't really, we didn't want to drink because I couldn't drink and play. That's for sure. I remember in Orlando, Tom and I used to drink during a certain, it was for some reason Orlando, because we kind of knew there were going to be shit, show, shit shows. Not all of them, but we were just like, let's just get wasted and let's just play. And him and I were on this. We're like, let's go for it, you know. But but more than not, we didn't. It wasn't allowed. Yeah, I never I never liked drinking before we played. Even if I had like two beers, I, mm-hmm. I remember doing it a couple times, and I'm like, I can't even like, I can't. And I was playing bass, which is the easiest instrument. I was like, I can't even play right now. So I just, even to this day, like, I never play drunk. I I'm always sober, and at the and then as soon as we're done, I'll like start drinking, but. Like even like last year we did the reunion show. I mean, we went on at like nine or 10 or something. And the whole time I'm sober, I'm like, I'm not getting up there. Like yeah. buzzed. I'm like, I'll like, nope. yeah, Chris will have like a glass of white wine or some shit like that. But back in the day he would get wrecked. I'm like, bro, we're in Ohio and you're hammered. And this is like the first time people are seeing us. Like they're going to remember this. They're not going to want to see us again. And so I was always yep. confused why bands would do that, but some bands could pull it off. Some bands can do it, I, you know. Yeah, that I, was just I, not I, I our can. thing. Me personally, and uh, you know, John and Josh didn't drink, and and Tom, Tom was like a social drinker. He was like I, you know what I mean. It wasn't like any like create, you know. After it'd be a different story, you know. But, I just saw you guys as being this airtight band because when you started playing, you all of you were just in, it was just you created this thing in the room where everyone would stop, even if no one knew who you guys were. 
as soon as you started playing, it's like you converted everyone in the room because they're like, this is just, I just witnessed something fucking insane. And the songs were super catchy. I mean, me and my friends, we used to blast on Merry Melodies like on repeat all the fucking time. So we, That's cool. I love, love that record. Oh my God. I lo- like, <laughs> I'm bummed I didn't record on it. I, I love it. <laughs> so like, okay. So you, you get in the van band you go out to japan you start touring like no oh we never did japan i'm sorry excuse me that never happened oh not, okay not, nothing nothing bad or nothing against any guys in the band it just never happened but i'll never forget that's what he said to me would you like to go to japan on tour and i was like uh yeah he's like well eventually this might happen you're like oh yeah okay and that's okay you know no, no big deal <laughs> but you so you get in the band and you guys start playing now they had they established a um, a fan base where, cause I know in Canada, you guys were gigantic and right. around the country, you were making friends with less than Jake and fat Mike. I think he like Tom had a, had at least like a, a, a one call connection. connection to him or something like sure. that. And so you guys were on that track to potentially be on that label. So with that being surrounding the van, the band, when, you know, when you joined the band that, that was kind of established and then you guys start touring. So did you notice that your crowds were, just like you started with just crowd singing the words back to you? Um, yeah, it, it, I definitely noticed it getting bigger and better as we went. Obviously, getting back to Orlando, we got bigger and better in Orlando. <laughs> um, Why Orlando? What was what was Orlando? Uh, oh, I don't know. It just seemed like there were shit shows. I played, I have it once again documented. I've played <laughs> over 500 shows with Piglin. Wow. Yeah. How often were you we, guys on the road? Were you, is that, was that just in a couple of years? Because you guys were consistently going out. The question is, when weren't we on the road? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll never forget, we did a tour. We came home, and my, my van was parked probably at John's house, and I drove back to Pennsylvania. I walk in the door, and my mom's like, Matt, Tom's on the phone. I'm like, I just got home. <laughs> and he's like, dude, we've got a show tonight in, in Jersey. I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> so... I drove straight back to Jersey for this fucking shit show, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, wait, wait, wait. what show, what show was this? Oh, dude. I mean, this was 90, 97, 98, probably. Well, you obviously have it documented. I have all listed. I have all, I mean, I have counts of people that were there. I have money that was made. I have a lot of stuff written down. Um, and we were, we were averaging 135 shows a year. Wow. And I was in a band for seven years. Jesus Christ. And we were just constantly, constantly touring and playing shows. But it's what it's what we did. It's like I said, blood, sweat, and tears. You know that song 13? That shit's true. <laughs> but wait, you didn't did you say what did you did you say what um what Jersey show that was? Because I'm oh, looking. Oh, no, I'm, I did not. No, I did not. Yeah, oh. I want to see because I have a NJP archives NJPP archives open. And this was what year? 96? 97. Um, all right. I'm a, I don't care. I have nothing bad. Whatever. I don't give a shit anymore. Um, <laughs> no one's going to get mad that you didn't like playing the show in Jersey. Was, there was a band, a New Jersey band, and it was like an older guy that was in the band, and it was a punk band. Okay. And they used to play a lot. And we played with them. And I don't mean to sound – he seemed sketchy towards girls, but you're talking to this king of sketchy right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd walk into a venue. I'd be like, you know what? I need to find a place, to sh- a clean place to shit, a clean, a, a place to fucking hook up with a girl. And if I didn't find a p- clean place, I'd fuck in that bathroom. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Fuck it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. A band, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, if I'm not making money, I'm going to roll with it. I didn't make money with Big Wig for the first five years. I'm like, fuck this. I'm going to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use this status to like, just talk to girls and just like take nice oh, shits in bathrooms without a doubt and i had that kurt cobain look i don't care i rolled with it <laughs> yeah i think i remember that i think i remember like you were the one bad look for me bad look for me but back then it worked Whatever. hey you had the long you had the long hair going back then yeah so like but when you whatever. when you were playing <laughs> when you played you obviously had your own presence and you were like the big thing that where we remember was you know i'll talk about the spider-man costume but the um like you would always just jump and that was the thing because you typically when people would watch bands play they the drummer gets kind of lost in the mix sure and I, was that kind of like you just so into it that you just just blew the fuck up or were you like i'm gonna be noticed as much as everyone else up here um yeah you know what it was um growing up 
playing drums, I was like, I should have played guitar because I would have been stage diving with my guitar on the crowd. You know, which I, I used to go see all hardcore bands, you know what I mean? So a lot of those hardcore band guitar players, bass players, they're just throwing themselves in the audience. Yeah. And that's why when I used to do songs, some of the times I was naked, some of the times I wasn't, my dick be hanging out of my boxer shorts. And I'd stage dive constantly because I was like, you know what? I'm back there behind the drums. And my thing is this, and I still say this, I said it yesterday to my drum students. We're entertainers. I don't care if you're in the best band in the world. I don't care if you're in the worst band in the world. Your job, in my opinion, is to entertain those people. Even if your band sucks, you can somebody can walk out and be like, that band sucked, but wow, did you see that drummer? Holy shit. <laughs> entertain. It's my job to entertain. And you know what? You got Tom freaking out, Josh thrashing around, and John being Mr. Bubbly Pogo guy freaking out. And I fed off of them. I felt they went nuts. I went more nuts and I tried to outdo them. <laughs> I tried to outdo them. I'm going to go faster. And, and Tom answered this in one of your questions too. Um, I agree with Tom how years ago we wanted to just play as fast as we could and go as nuts as we could. And then as we matured, it was more like, you know, what? let's play a little more tight. Let's hold off. You know, maybe we'll go a little nuts, but I mean, just in the beginning, it was just plays fast, hard and fuck shit up as you can yeah go for it. i mean that's like that's why people love the first either the first release or like the first release after like the second one typically is is where they figured it out and the first one could be a little rough but they find sure. that sound but there's such that there's that rawness because this is the first time you are figuring your sound out and within that experimenting comes this depending on the band can come these amazing songs and it's like the thing, you know, you have your whole life to write your first record and you have like 10 months to write the second one or two years. So you, that's where you, that's where I think a lot of bands, they'll go, okay, well, you know, our whole life we wrote that first record or was, we all left different bands and came together to write this record and it all just came together. But the second one, you sit and think about it a bit more. You yeah. Know, you, you're like listening to new sounds and like new, newer bands are around you and you're thinking like, shit, that's such a cool thing. I mean, that's happened with us. We, at that time we wrote our second record, like we were listening, like Saves a Day came out with Through Being Cool and they had all these crazy breakdowns and we were listening to like such a great hum. record. Yeah. There was all <laughs> these different time signatures and we're going, our first record is just so fast. Good. But then it's like, well, how do we break that up? And also, we're really tired about four songs in. Maybe we should throw a little slower song in here. So Absolutely, yeah. You want to break it up, yeah. You so know, like when you, sorry, yeah. So when you guys were like writing "Stay Asleep," how? What year was that? Was that '98 when you put that out? '99 that came out. We might have recorded. Oh my God, you're gonna ask that question. It came out definitely '99, and um, we went out to uh, California for 48 days and. We stayed with Joanna Hackett, love her. Yeah. And she, she once again, just kept kept us glued together because we fought constantly. I've had pictures of John Castaldo drinking a can of soup out of the can. We used to buy a loaf of bread and we'd get ketchup packets and we would eat bread with ketchup on it, breakfast, lunch, supper. And when somebody would find money, be like, where did you get that money? How did you, how were you able to buy that food? You know what I mean? Um, I kicked a piece of corn on the cob on Hollywood Boulevard and I looked at it and John goes, don't even think about it. We were so starving. Really? And then I'll say, I don't care, whatever. I, I got scabies from a girl in Hollywood. So the itching and a bugging, I'm scratching, you know, number thir song 13, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing backing vocals and I'm screaming, my balls fucking itch. So... The drive from California back to New Jersey was uh, a three or four day drive and nobody sat next to me. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I, I had did... to go to the clinic <laughs> when I got back and, uh, you know, I had scabies, put a little cream on it, they go away. I, I Burn my clothes. I just did an interview with Tommy Latex, Tommy Rockstar from Latex Generation, which is coming out this week. And he talks about how he slept in. He was staying with, I believe... Uh, the singer from Tilt, 
he was staying his the the band was staying with her while they were in California and she, her one of her roommates was Matt Freeman from Oh yeah Rancid Rancid yeah and Tommy goes yeah so I slept I slept in Matt's bed and I ended up getting scabies he goes oh, no way. he goes so he's like uh, I forget how he said it but I think he's like yeah so to this day it's like I just say like yeah I got scabies from Matt Freeman he's like I'm not 100 percent sure but it definitely was his bed or I got it I'm that's like, funny I was like that's gross dude you can yeah you can it's you know what, scabies scabies is actually it's not necessarily a sexually transmitted disease yeah I it's mean, like just it's just like from, you can get it from a couch or like yeah. a car seat or something right and yeah. but it was funny tom you know because that's when tom ripped his acl we played at the whiskey and what happened was we ran out of money because we were supposed to play shows while we were out there for 48 days yeah and tom ripped his acl at the whiskey and you know what big ups to tom he finished the set sitting down in agonizing pain then he went to the emergency room wow yeah yeah that's fucking hardcore <laughs> and, but you know what i'm gonna toot my horn i played a show in toronto at the elma combo had a seizure on stage while we were playing took a five minute break then proceeded to sing a song tom played drums and i started doing stage dives Wait, stage who, dives who, everybody who, in the <laughs> audience was like who the fuck is this guy <laughs> That's incredible. That's one of my seizure seizure uh, situations. And the interesting story about that was, while I was having, I had a seizure while playing two songs, and um, I was looking at John, Josh, and Tom, and I'm like, who are they? I know them. Who am I? Why am I? What oh, am no. I doing here? Meanwhile, we played Flavor Ice, and I can't remember the other song. And after I threw my drumsticks down, I ran off stage, and I covered my head, and I yell, I'm having a fucking seizure. Tom's like. Okay, crowd, our drummer's having a seizure. Monkey comes running over. He's like, I'll get you water. He runs over to the bar. They're like, two bucks, three bucks for water. He's like, give me that fucking water. Our drummer's having a seizure. <laughs> wow. So he came running back with me to give me the water. And then five minutes later, whatever, I get up and I sing some songs and do stage dives into the audience. So when you were having that, because I I'm, I'm, was like, we, you know, we were doing the interview. When we started this, my dog started having one, so we did cut it back to this when when i see him having it i heard it doesn't it's not painful and it, it, you know they're they're like explain what it is and they say you know if they ha if it's a long period of time it can fry their brain but if yes. it's like a minute or 30 um you know they come out of it and it takes them about an hour and he's like you know back and he's on meds and things like that so when when you're having one or when you had one were you shaking or like because you said you played two songs and you started forgetting who you were but you were able to just like function and then when you went off stage were you on the ground like convulsing uh with that one no um and it, i i don't want this to affect i don't want you to it, it's it's it you feel like you're dying it's terrifying um the my last seizure i had was an hour-long grandma oh my god yeah, it was, I, I thought I had, my, my, my neurologist told me I might have brain damage. And, and I walked out of that, that clinic and I, I bawled my eyes out and I told my wife and my son was a lot younger than I was like, listen, you're a beautiful girl. If I become a vegetable, put me in my parents' basement, you go live your life. Wow. And she goes, I love you. Are you kidding me? She's like, I'm in it for the long haul. And it, and it took me a good six months to get back on track. Wow. And, um, I actually had a, uh, you probably never heard of this. Most people haven't, including my neurologist. I had a running seizure. What is that? I ran point eight. Oh, oh, we'll run it. You were a mile. Running. Okay. I ran almost one mile having a seizure. So I was at my old girlfriend's house where I love you, lovey dovey, blah, blah, blah. And I guess I said, I love you. And I turn around and I start running as fast as I can. And she's like, what is he doing? He's being a stupid moron, just trying to make me laugh. And she realizes I get like halfway down. I'm headed out onto like a main road. She's like, Jesus Christ, he's having a fucking seizure. She gets in her car, drives past me. Now, I don't know all this. She's telling me this. The funny part is before I went to see my, my girlfriend, I dropped my grandmother, who's like 85 years off, 85 years old, off at a store. She comes running out of the store yelling, Matthew, Matthew, where are you going? I'm running past her. I'm running full force as much as I can. My, my girlfriend pulls in front of me, comes running up towards me, and I look at her. I'm like, why do I know this girl? Who is this girl? She looks so familiar. And she gets like 10 feet from me. And I'm, I, I go, Abby, what, what are you doing here? She goes, Matt, you're having a seizure. I go, and I dropped and I, and I started crying. I'm like, how the fuck did I get here? And she's like, you ran from my house. 
and and her house is I, I t- measured it. It's point. It's almost a mile. You can so you can physically do things when you're having a seizure instead of just convulse. Um. Yeah. I. I the the last one I had to. I almost ran out to a road. Wow. I think what it is. I try to run away. If I feel in my brain, first of all, I can feel like you're dying. Second, you feel like if you run away from it, it'll go away. And, and it doesn't. The last one I had to the eight years ago, the one, the one that was like an hour long, yeah. um, I, I almost ran out to more of a major road than the one with my ex-girlfriend years back. And when the, when the uh, ambulance picked me up and took me to the hospital, I was in and out and I was like, this is my time. I'm dying. Jeez. And you know how they say your brain doesn't feel pain? Yeah. Fuck that. My brain felt like it was on fire. It felt I heard sizzling. <laughs> That's what I heard right before I went out. And it was right in front of a drum student, too. <laughs> oh, my God, man. Yeah. I have no idea how to pull this back into the interview. <laughs> oh, no, no, we're good, we're good. No, it's fucking, you know what I mean? Holy shit. Um, so oh, it's pretty, my it's, it's, God. It's, it's, there's nothing. It's just a terrifying thing to live with. It so really. When you had that, though, and you were on stage, was that the first time they had seen that happen? And at the Elma Combo in Toronto, yes, the big time with, with the first time Big Wig have seen that. Uh, another time in Canada, I had a seizure. Uh, we were at, it's called Exo Skate Shop. And then another time was in Indianapolis, and I had a seizure there. And that one, Tom had to shut the show down. He's like, show's over, folks. Go home. And that one was a pretty, pretty bad one. Was there a conversation with you guys when you started having this where they were like, hey, man, like, selfishly were they go like yeah we we don't know what to do with this or they're going hey no you're we're just gonna just weather the storm with this no um you know tom was always um tom's a pretty smart guy we you know we all know that very very he's hilarious smart guy funny guy and he was always good with stuff like that and i always had trust in tom to know what to do in all honesty you know what i mean not that i did with josh or john or the rest of the guys but i knew you know what level-headed tom could be on point with that shit yeah. And make sure all of us were safe. Um, he used to say no, no strobe lights, but strobe lights never bothered me. Um, there was really no reason until I heard two weeks ago, like I said, with my sister telling me that bone went into my blood and that's why I have seizures, whether that's true or not. I don't know. If anybody's a doctor, please let me know the yeah. answer on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, but um, yeah, I, I knew Tom would have taken care of me. Absolutely. You know what I mean with that aspect. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna. I have so many questions, and I no, that's fine. I, I, I know, but I mean, I I feel bad transitioning off of this because it's such a it, no, no, it's okay. But it's such a it's like a goddamn. So okay, so at this point, were you guys was stay asleep out at this point? With, with the seizure thing, I'm sorry. Or yeah, before this, or, yeah, this because you had said. Um, you had there was a show in Toronto. You played the two songs. You went off stage, you know, holding your heads. You're like, I'm having a seizure, and then that was before you guys were in California recording stage. Yes. Okay. I'm I'm almost I'm almost timeline. I'm almost that's something I would have to go back to. A okay, journal. that's that's where it transitioned because you were talking about being in California. You're on Sunset. You see corn on the cob. John says, "Don't do it." And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Hollywood Boulevard thing. Yeah, I got to. Okay, eat. so did you <laughs> did you eat the corn on the cob? No, no. But you wanted to, I mean, but you were that hungry. Yeah, we were starving. It was, it was, uh, Stay Asleep is, I really hope people kind of enjoy that record. I mean, it because it was, it sucked recording it. We, we were just, we were going to kill each other and we all just had our own demons. And uh, we fired the guy who worked with the Beatles that was uh, doing that record. Really? Yeah. Some guy that worked with the Beatles. Maybe we shouldn't have. <laughs> Did he it? came in to work with us for one day. I don't remember his name. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> yep, gave him the boot. You're like, you're, your time's up, bro. You're, you're, Holy you're, regret you're skilled on that one, probably, but whatever. <laughs> Wait, did, rock. You guys didn't work with Ryan Green on the on that album, right? It was the second one, or the third one? That, where... was, that was the third one, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Jim Goodwin, who did, um, I think he did like Ignite and Straight Faced, and I don't really remember. Well, what it was, it was supposed to be Donald Cameron. Um, he's the guy who did a lot of the classics, you know what I mean? And, um, like what? Well, give me an album. I, I um, he did Propagani. Oh, he did the Bad Religion records. Yes, um, that's right. He did uh, God, Let's Talk go Rock. Uh, Donald Cameron. 
he did a shitload. But I, he did I less. did strung out. Was it less he, talk more rock though that he did? Because it was that was the second one. The first one was uh, how to clean everything. I I could, I could fucking look this up. Yeah, I don't I don't know, but I, I definitely um I'm pretty sure probably like oh Pennywise I'm sure recorded there. A lot of big cool bands that I think that we would like, and and that's what it was because it it was like. I don't, we weren't ready to go out and Tom's like, we are not going to lose the chance of recording in this nostalgic, you know, place where these record, famous records were recorded. And at first, I, I, I know there was some discrepancy between me, John and Josh about going out there, at least from what I remember. And, and obviously I'm glad we did. It's, it's all, it's all learning experience, no matter what. And, um, you know, it's something I will never forget. And, um, you know, it's pretty, in my life, that's, kind of pretty historic you know i mean i bummed up and down <laughs> hollywood Wait. boulevard for a bunch of months <laughs> so i got a so a couple things came up there um so it's donnell like d-o-n-n-e-l or donald d-o-n-n-e-l d-o-n-n-e-l-l okay okay donald cameron yeah because i was typing yep. it in i put donald's and it in google finished with trump and i was like oh that's the wrong oh one. no yeah we don't want that guy no, I don't, <laughs> oh wait i, I don't want to get political yeah yeah we'll, we'll save it from that but oh another i almost got i got hooked i tried to get hooked up by this by this gay guy on hollywood boulevard <laughs> he pulls over in this sketchy van and gets out he's like hey you kind of look like kurt cobain i'm like yeah i'm fucking starving he's like you like blowjobs i'm like yeah i'm fucking starving He's like, why don't you come up the Hollywood Hills with me? Get my van. I'll feed you. I'll get you blown by these hot chicks right now. And I'm like, no, I got to go record a record. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. Yeah, I turned him down. I don't know what would have happened if I went up there. You probably wouldn't be doing this interview. You'd see me on a milk carton. (laughs) Wait, this is on Sunset? On Hollywood Boulevard. Right right outside where we were recording our record. That is. That was right, right off of Hollywood. It was. We'd walk out the back and walk out the front. Hollywood's right there. And. It's down by, I don't know if you're, it's like by the Pantages down by that way. Okay. So one of the things that was very relevant or was very, what's the way, how can I say this? One of the things that was, that I remember about when Stay Asleep came out, the conversation was the drums were too low. Absolutely. Okay. What, how, why did that happen? I'm a sucky drummer. No, I don't know. Um, like, was it, it was, like, did you guys in the mix? Because I remember when we did, when Lanemeyer did If There's a Will, we were, I was in the room with Chris Badami and we were mixing the songs. And this, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. But I remember when we did the last song, which is Broken Dream November, I remember saying to him, like, hey, turn the guitars up because I want to hear them more. And when the mix was done and we came out, everyone's like, why are the guitars so high? And I was like, I don't know why I thought of doing that, but I was part of that decision to do that. Sure. Were you part of that decision or were you in the room making the call to no. turn the drums down? No, nah, I'll go there. I don't care. I didn't have much decision in making in big wig. When we were recording that, I did this flashy drum fill and Tom goes, this is not the Matt Gray experience. This is big wig. Go in there and change your fucking drum fill. Quote Tom Petta. Okay. And then we got back that night. We listened to it. He goes, you know what, Matt? I like that drum fill. And guess what? That drum fill sucks. I listen to it nowadays and it sucks. <laughs> which song is that he in? He was right. <laughs> which, which song is that in? Dent. In Dent? I was trying to do a Jordan from Strung Out drum fill and it just, it didn't go with the song. But that's how I was feeling. And 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 no, I didn't have much say with Big Wig. <laughs> Seven years. <laughs> I don't care. Did you, <laughs> did you find though? So stay asleep. And yeah, cause that was, I remember, I don't know who I was talking to. I think it might've been even been Jeremy from, um, humble. I think he even said he, he I think it might've been him, him who pointed that out to me. Cause I didn't really recognize it. And then I remember playing in my car. I'm going, yeah, I cannot hear the fucking drums. And then a lot of people had said that. So it was right. just like, I, it was like one of those things from back then that I just remembered as this not highlight, but stuck with me. And again, right. it was like, I always wanted to know the answer to this, but there we go. The whole, the whole process was a shit show. It, it, it was a nightmare. It really, looking back, it, it was a nightmare. It, it sucked. You know what I mean? But but we got through it. You know what I mean? Like I said, I mean, we, we went through three different guys trying to record the record. You know, Tom rips his ACL. I get scabies. We're starving. You know what I mean? And, and it was just one thing after another. It was fights constantly. Did you feel you know, it was forced? Like it was a forced record because you guys went from Unmarried Melodies which you know which was huge where people loved that record and then there was kind of this all right shit we i know because i know i know that 
I had heard that you guys were on the radar, Fat Mike's radar, potentially. Sure. Or, or Tom really wanted to get you guys on Fat. Right. And so then there's there's that. There's the fact that you guys aren't making money. You're starving. So, I mean, all of that adds up when you're – then you can feel that stress in a release, in a, in a, in a, in a record. So it sounds like all of that just culminated, and that's what basically created the sound of that record. I, I agree. I definitely think that was part of why that record is a, a more heavy than, you know, heavy driven and, and and guitar driven. You know what I mean? And yeah. I, I don't remember how it came about with the drums being that low. And and I remember years later, Tom even saying the same things like, yeah, the drums were just you know too low and everything like that. And uh, you know. There's there's a there's some things with that record and I'll say it like I don't my tempos weren't the best and and you know I, I look back and I'm like man but it once again it was just a shit show it it was just um, I I I didn't know how to tune drums so we had to pay Mike Fasano to come and tune the drums God knows how much that guy got paid to tune drums okay I know what I get from the starting line. I make more money with the starting line in a year than I did with Big Wing and Seven. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those guys take care of me. They're awesome. Love them. That's amazing. They're family. They're 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 the best guys ever. And that is true, by the way, monetarily wise. So I can't imagine how much Mike Fasano made because I didn't know how to tune drums back then. I was a punk rock drummer. I didn't care. I just wanted to get laid and play drums. You know, I I've said it so many times, and I'll constantly say it. It's just those motherfuckers who weren't in bands, or maybe they're in bands that we, in the band is where you don't make any money. It's the out. No. It's the the uh, the the surrounding pieces, the 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 producers. The, oh yeah. The, the techs, the roadies, yep. like. The managers, like everyone makes fucking money, but the core of it, which is giving them a job, is the music and the bands make shit. And yeah, I don't manager. fucking <laughs> understand. Yeah, I don't understand it. Like, even if the band isn't that great, or like, even the band's touring all the time, they don't make money. It's like the people around them fucking make money. You're like, yeah. it, like the booking agents, it's it's such a racket. It's, it's fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> like the merch it guy is, makes money, up more money off of them. Everyone gets, everyone gets it for their fucking art. It's like, what the fuck? My friend's the guitar tech for All American Rejects, and he told me how much they get paid and how much the manager gets, and it is fucking substantial. You can buy a house with how much he gets. Even one show. E- <laughs> <to the> man- <laughs> one show. So even that fucking band doesn't make any money. Like the manager makes more than the band. Oh yeah. Get the fuck out of here. That oh uh, uh, no excuse me let me take that back and I'm not shit talking all American rejects friends, no 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 friends, no I mean it just yeah, I don't yeah. I don't want that getting out you know what I mean because I'm great they're, love Chris you know what I mean that drummer's awesome he actually asked me for drum lessons one uh, over the summer I go uh, <laughs> that's awesome uh really I'm like <laughs> let's hang out sometime I felt like a big dork <laughs> but I was pretty stoked man I, you're I, like I, you I, heard I, stay I, asleep I, right <laughs> yeah yeah right yeah no one don't go there. <laughs> But I'm a sucker for that band. I love them. And we, we actually, it was cool. The starting line, fast forwarding, we did a stadium tour with them oh across, uh, I don't know if it was full US, but man, I watched that band every night and it was, they're just incredible. And my wife's like, what are you doing? Hanging out with chicks? I'm like, no, believe it or not, I'm watching All American Rejects. She's like, you're a fucking hardcore kid. You don't like that shit. <laughs> You're like, you're like, this is the I hidden, this is the inner, this is the inner part of me that I don't want anyone to know, but it's like, I love the bubble gum. I love it. I love oh, the, the catchiness. It. Bring it. When they first came out, that song, Swing Swing, I loved that song. And the rest of the record, I was like, eh, that's all right. But they, they, I saw some interview with them when the second record came out. That this What's the lead singer's name? Tyson. He is one of the he was one of the funniest fucking people I saw being interviewed. Like he had a really good he was really good on camera and a really good personality. Oh, he like yeah. that well, he's per- a mo- he was a model, so I don't know if he still is. Oh, but yeah, I, I, that makes sense. He had like the face yeah. that he was like a model, and he mm-hmm. like weighed like a hundred pounds, soaking wet. It looked like. Yeah. So, okay, so going back to okay, we sta- go back. Sorry. So no, I love this. This jumps all over the place, but it's so fascinating to me. I love it. Um, so stay asleep comes out f- after. 48 days of being in, in Hollywood. Okay, so when you guys hell. finished the record, and the, the hell in Hollywood, you guys finished the record. How long was it from the finishing the recording process to it actually being in your hands? I don't know that question. I don't know the answer for that. I, I really, I honestly don't. 
that's probably a better Tom, John, Josh question with that one. Okay. But yeah. actually, you know, before – okay. Actually, I'm going to sneak this in here. Oh, we, I didn't feel rushed. That's – getting back to your question before. I guess yeah. you kind of got sidetracked. Sorry. Yeah, sure. I don't think I personally was rushed. I know Tom wanted to get out and record and everything like that. I don't think I was rushed. Um, as, I think subconsciously as, it must have been there though. You know, I, I don't remember as far as that. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, again, this is all spec. This is just me looking back 20 years sure. ago and just thinking like I have a theory. And it sometimes I I'm, I'll tell it to people and they're like, you know what, you're you're pretty spot on. But sometimes they're like, I don't really know. It's like, yeah, I mean, you're not going to 100 percent know. But it's just it right. seems from and sometimes I like to play like a therapist role for some weird reason because I'm just fascinated by the way people think or they process things. It seems like sure. all those pieces around it that's what culminated into what that was. Um, but at the same time, this is the question that kind of sneaks in here. The you guys had re-recorded Flavor Ice and Falling Down and 1-800 Whipped, and I remember like hearing that on the record and. When I hear, because I loved, the, I thought uh, Mary Melodies was great. The the seven inch you guys did would have had flavor ice and then jerk on it, which I still have to this day. Uh, I used to go nuts over that. And then one eight hundred whipped was on, I think the serial killer comp, or Correct. yeah, and I think other yes. comps that might have been on it. So all of that just to me was just perfect. And then when the things are re recorded, I'm always like, I don't like huh. it. Yeah, I, I don't like. It. You know what? I think we needed filler for stay asleep. I think that's maybe why. Yeah, I, I was gonna say like what, and, and the sell out on there is, too. Is, yeah. Flavor Ice is the first song that I recorded for stay asleep, and I did it in one take. Really? I did falling down in one take. Really? Yep, one take with falling down. I have it all written down. Falling it, down was one take. Flavor Ice was one take, and Flavor Ice was the first song that I recorded. And Jerk was the last song I recorded, and I could not get it right, and I had to keep doing it for some reason. And we used a different snare drum on Jerk. That's so funny because it's such a slow song. Yep. Well, because we want because it's slow ballad, you want a deeper snare drum. Yeah, but just the fact do that I, you couldn't do I get sound it. Sound like a drum tech? Ha ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Now when you know. You play like... a ballad, you want a deeper eight by fourteen <laughs> snare drum. You know, you don't want a piccolo. <laughs> Fucking like, how old were you when you did Stay Asleep? Were you in your twenties or thirty? Oh, 20, Yeah, I'm old. Um, I was probably 26. I mean, as far as a number, I'm not sure. 26, 27, somewhere in that bracket. I was the oldest, of course, of all of them. I was oldest. I was the oldest one in all of Big Wig. I mean, there was yeah, I do almost remember that. ten different members of my seven-year career with Big Wig. <laughs> ten different people jumping in and out. Well, I was gonna say, like, fucking late 20s, Matt is going, God damn it, you're so knowledgeable now in your older age of all this drum stuff that you were like, I didn't really know like that much about it back then, like tuning your drums, and now you're like, didn't a know, didn't pro. care. Yeah, so didn't crazy. Care. Okay, so the record comes out, you guys, in it, yeah, you guys had about four songs you had re-recorded for this. I think even sell out. No, sell out. Oh no, sell out was on a comp too. I think right. I think it was so. on a cassette. There's two different versions of sellout. Yes. But what was what was the one? Oh, friends. Okay, I'm jumping all over the place, but I wanted to no, just bring this up because I'm I'm looking through the the songs. I'm going, yep, I remember this because a lot of the record, there's you know the songs on here. I'm like still dent smile. Those were all new. Then I was like, oh, flavor ice. I remember that and falling down. I'd seen that. That was on a comp as well. But friends, I remember the moment you guys played that for the first time. I believe it was the first time. Uh, we you were at Skaters Worlds. In my memory, Love you were at Skaters I World. Remember. You guys got back from tour. And Tom goes, we just wrote this song last night. We're going to try it out today. And it's about, and I think you guys wrote it about the, uh, I, I talked about him in a couple of episodes. He was your roadie. Look, once again, I had nothing to do with lyrical. That was, from what I know, that's 100% Tom. But what was the story? Like why, what happened with that? Because he ended up um, roadieing for, again, this is like, I know he had, pa he's passed away like since sure. then. And this isn't the show. I'm just like, I'm just interested in what the, the, the um, origin of the song was and what the story is behind it and like why that was written. Cause it was very, cause that's what he, Tom gets in the mic and goes, you know, we wrote this last night and I think he had, he didn't, he, he didn't say his name, but he had mentioned like, he alluded to it. And I was like, what happened there? And to this day, I was like, I don't know. So that's why I'm going to ask you like, what was this? What was the situation? I don't really know what happened, but I mean, just simply put him and Tom probably butted heads. That's all. I mean, just tore shit. Uh, you know, we drove across from New Jersey to Montreal, picked up Monkey, and we drove six days straight. Not Vancouver, Vancouver Island. Six <laughs> days straight to do a tour with 10-foot pole. Yes. And on the way back, it was nothing but mushrooms. 
on that tour. <laughs> um, the Big 10-foot pole thought we were all druggies. You know what I mean? <laughs> that was pretty fun. Six days in a van. Can you imagine that? Straight. Straight. No no breaks. But it's Carter. Carter was his name. I Carter. remember that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I've i gone back to people. I mean, I think the, the first half of this whole season, which I've said before, it was just me talking to people. Like, see, episode three is me or yeah three is me talking to Heath from Midtown and I'm like I was so jealous of you guys I was such an asshole I hated your band because you were so bad it's like I'm getting like to say like my apologies to people to be like I'm sorry oh, right dick. I'm so sorry so it's like I knew what it was like back then so yes to write a song about someone in that moment in your early 20s your late teens you have this so much more aggression so yes obviously that feeling has probably gone away but it's just from back then it's 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 interesting to look back and say, oh, yeah, that was the scenario. Like, yeah, that's just, you know, stupid yep. situation, just whatever it was. But <laughs> now, I remember when – oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go. You go, you go. I remember when Midtown – that what a great band. Wow. Yeah. When Because we were doing okay. And we're like big wigs. Like, we were, we're doing all right and everything like that. We, we got some fans. We're doing pretty cool. And then came Midtown, and I was like, ah, oh, they blew up our, our spotlight. And there's like, there's no – we can't play after that band. I don't know if we ever did, but I wouldn't want to. They were a great band. They were that wreck. I mean, my that God, I listen to that record. I'm like, still to this day, I'm like, holy shit. There's a guy at my office that he just started listening to my podcast because there was um, a friend of mine. She works in this uh, this this company here because I work in a co-working space. And she was, we were just like bullshit. She's like, oh, what do you do? I was like, well, I do things. I also have a punk podcast. She's like, really? I go, yeah. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't know. So she, her boyfriend listens to punk. So she tried to tell him to listen to it. And it's, it's hard to get people to listen to podcasts. It's like very, like, you don't trust it, but once you like it, you like love it. And that, that's the way I do it. But she has been telling people about it. So this one guy, he, he's about 10 years younger than me. So we were talking yesterday and he's like, I was like, yeah, here's some bands you might know. I was like, do you know Midtown? He's like, I think I've heard of them. I go, go listen to their first record. I was like, it still awesome. holds up and it's still really fucking good. He's like, okay, Absolutely. I'll check up. But that, just to kind of just add to your point of that record, I didn't want to like it. I, I so wanted to hate it. But when every guy was asleep in the van, I'd pop it in and listen to it. And I'm like, it literally would take me, I mean, however the length of the record, I'd be beginning to end. And it would just take me through driving the van in early morning just to pass that time because I would just... I'd be so into that record. I, I'd always be done. I'm like, fuck. Now I'm like paying attention to like have the shittiness of driving. Sure. <laughs> I hear so you. Good. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when you guys, you so, okay. So stay asleep comes out, you have it in your possession. You guys are playing this. When, at, at what point did uh, Josh and John leave? Did they leave at the same time? Uh, I totally remember the night John quit. Tom got in a fight with John's girlfriend. John was pissed off. And he said, I don't know if he said, fuck you to Tom, but he said, I quit. He grabbed his base and he walked out and that took place in Newburgh, New York at the Twilight Zone. I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. And I don't know if it was that show, but really nice neighborhood right around the block. They found a, a hooker burnt, dead hooker. She was burnt a lot. Well, I don't know a lot. Oh, my burnt. God. Yeah, I don't know if it was that show because we played we played there quite often with like ah, Love Johnny, Beefcake, 99 Cents, Lounge, all those bands. Great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Cooter, all those guys. Um, but and John quit and then Josh hung on and uh, Tom did say something. Josh was really into doing the shows and, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. And Josh hung around for a little bit more. And I think we did. And then we did a tour. We had a Canadian tour. And then we had this guy Rivers fill in on bass. That might have been the 10 foot pole tour. I can't remember. But um, that was one of the other big wig members amongst many that was coming in and out of the revolving door and after john or yeah let's say who left, came who came in because they like the mat or um uh max and jeremy both came in at the same time then bass because you could john yeah. john playing john played bass so you obviously yep. had to have a bass player come in but i don't remember anybody else besides max playing bass after him okay wow you got me on this okay Aha. so john john leaves first then josh um can we skip the part when it actually, I, I definitely know Tom and I might've tried out a couple different members cause he would come to my house or no, if we tried out people, it was more down in Jersey. Like a lot of big wig stuff, like I said, was all in my parents' basement. Those guys used to haul ass up to Pennsylvania wow. cause we could practice until 12 at night. My parents wouldn't give a shit. 
You know what I mean? And they live close um, to Strasburg, right? East Strasburg? Uh, no, I'm total country boy. Um, okay. To explain where I live, I live five minutes from the New York border. Um, it's great. Where I live, we don't have off for Martin Luther King Day. We have off for the first day of hunting season. Very important around here. <laughs> very, very, very important to have off that first day of hunting season. You got to get rid of the Martin bears, Luther bro. King you got to get rid of the yeah. bears. I had a rifle. I was on the rifle team at school. We used to shoot guns in our school. I think, well, I mean, you're in the middle of the fucking woods. Like, what else are you going to yep. do besides, you know, we shoot, used to shoot lunch, and dinner? In, in our basement of the school. Can you imagine that nowadays? Anyway. Wow. But so getting back after, let's just, if we can go, I don't know, timeline. But but, um, but then Jeremy and Max came in at that sure. point. Because you guys, was we played with you guys that weekend where we went out to Binghamton. And I talked to Tom about this. We went to Binghamton, New York. That's where I told the story about Steve where he showed us the video with the Barbie dolls. And they were like, it was like a Barbie doll porn. Do you remember okay. That? Yep, okay. Yep, I yep. think you, you might have been in the room, or you might have been. I know Tom was in was in the apartment when we were watching this, or his house. And then the next day, we were driving to Vermont or New Hampshire, but we drove through Vermont, and we we all went sleigh riding. I will never forget that. That was love it. We have Such video a great footage. Memory. Sean found all these Landmeyer like VHS tapes, which I still need to digitize. And then one of them I know is he took his camcorder and when we all of us like hooked together on our tubes and we're going down the hill just like screaming like little kids we're like this is great it's so funny because i was in vermont a couple years ago and and i still have that vision of what that hill looked like and i passed something and i told my wife i'm like stop she's like what i'm like back up and i'm like there's no way that can be the same hill i'm like but it just reminded me of that time and i loved it i know, I, I remember that perfectly i can visualize we're driving we're just driving along and we just at the corner of our left we're like oh that looks like fun and all of a sudden with the left blinker goes on the big league <laughs> van we're like get the fuck out of it. we like all started freaking out and tom pulls in and he goes i'm paying for all of this we're like fuck yeah <laughs> so great good times absolutely yeah that was we were at that time because Stay Asleep came out on Kung Fu. And so Joe Escalante, or Escalante, whatever, yep. uh, he was from the Vandals, the bass player, the bassist. He ran Kung Fu, and I think it might be debunked now, but we, Tom gave us, um, he gave Sean a connection to Joe. So we were we were talking to Joe at this time to potentially get on Kung Fu. And that was oh, like, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was like our or vision. So that weekend, I think, I don't know if that was before or after that, but I think Tom kind of pay, started paying attention to us and was like, I'm going to try to help you guys or connect you guys so you guys can start growing. And then from there, like we, I remember we were playing some shows and Tom would go out of his way to, even when you guys weren't playing to watch us, we're like, oh my God, like this is it. Like we're going to fucking break around that whole time. That's when I think we were, that was a big thing about that weekend, but it was also big because that was when you guys got jeremy and max in, and that's like where it started becoming like the fucking um spinal tap of guitarists and bass players for you guys right yeah everybody it was revolving door at that point. i mean i'll tell you what um i don't know if i can fast forward into invitation to tragedy or not yet yeah sure um getting into invitation to tragedy we had jeremy and mm -hmm. and max i mean that kid that he he moved out of his country to come and live in Jeremy's basement. That's and right. I will stick with this until I die. Invitation to Tragedy has a lot to do with Max. Yeah, he was a really good Max drummer too, was there right? Every freaking day, Max was there. And I, w I was working, Tom was in Jersey, and Jeremy, not that Tom, obviously, blah, 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 but Max was there every freaking day, all the time, constantly. He was keeping the, the, the process moving along. And, um, and I loved, I loved Invitation to Tragedy. It was harder, had a better sound, in my opinion. I love the songs. Great story about Moosh. Um, yeah, I was just looking at that in the list. Great story about Moosh was Tom was in Jersey, and we recorded in Pennsylvania. And I called him up, and I'm like, we need another song. He's like, okay, tap out a song on your legs. And I'm like, what do you want? You want verse? Here's where, you know, what do you want? I'm like, why don't we do a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, end. He goes, Matt, that's perfect. So I tap out this simple beat. Five minutes later, I go in, one take, I record Moosh, done. There's certain songs on albums where – Jimmy World is a prime example for me. Jimmy World, when they – Yeah, I agree. When I, can, they, I already know where you're going, yeah. If, okay, maybe. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. So, oh, when, okay. <laughs> so when I would hear Jimmy at World Records, there was always one song that was so different. And then from there, the next record I felt was – 
based off of that newer direction they went with that one song. My point is that I felt that Invitation to Tragedy was a harder record, which I felt was kind of coming off of Fallen Down, which I loved. But it kept that big wig, like, high-pitched guitar, trebly like, solo action to it. But it just went in, like, more of a, like, a harder direction. Yeah. I, I think that's what I kind of think that's what we kind of wanted. To but do. you can I mean, see that though from pre, like there's that one song that stands out where through the swim probably. I yeah, like that's, well, pretty, through, that's a ripper. Well, through the through the mix of Unmerry Melodies, it was all just very it was poppy and Fat Records. It, but then Falling Down came out, and then that Falling Down, and then it, then that was added to Stay Asleep, which had like Dent and Dent had like that breakdown in it. Um, but then I felt like that those are the songs where now you're like Tom was testing out the waters on something he wanted a bit more hardcore because you guys also played sure. you guys played like a slayer riff into the intro of a song or yes yeah or you did a cover of a hardcore a gorilla biscuits we did song. we did yeah we did that well we did we we recorded slayer uh war ensemble <laughs> took tom <laughs> took tom six hours to do one solo. uh three hours to do the one solo three hours for another solo <laughs> i can imagine yeah, shit. the guy was getting pretty pissed. He's like, you've been doing one solo for three hours? You guys got to get out of here. <laughs> three hours for one solo, three hours for the other solo. But it's but like, I, I, it I saw, awesome. yeah, and I saw that, it's like I felt on stage that he was trying to go, he'd be like, I want to be more hard, because he would give his guitar to someone and he would grab the mic and just be like doing like more hardcore thing. So I was like, yeah. so Invitation to Tragedy, I was like, this makes sense that I kind of saw this was going in this direction. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I think, how do I know? I don't, I wasn't there for the recording of, of Unmerry Melodies, but Unmerry Melodies. Yeah. Was- did you notice though, that it was going like you guys were having a harder, cause you, you know, I also said that you brought like that harder hardcore sound to it as well. Like not full hardcore, but there was a, there was an edge. Yeah. An edge. yeah. I, I kind of, I think I pushed Tom for that. Not in a bad way. I, I kind of think it was, you know, I think it was all of us just, I think, Unmarried Melodies was crazy catchy and pop is all hell. Yeah. And then we get tired and dirty and diseases and sick and broken limbs and just fed up and we're pissed off more now and let's just write harder stuff. Maybe, I, I, I don't know, maybe that's a natural progression of it. You know what stand up is about? That's on Stay Asleep? Nothing. There's no, there's no, yeah, it's about nothing. <laughs> I asked Tom, I'm like, what is that about? He's like, ah, nothing. <laughs> just, I need Good filler. Answer. I need some filler right now. You're like, I just need to get through this what it was. fucking it's record. Filler. Hey, it's catchy. I love that song. It's catchy. That was a, that was a hardcore song. You know what I mean? That was an edgy, hardcore song. And, and you know what? The lyrics sound great in it, and it works. You know what? Hey, does every song in the world have to have a meaning? No. No. You know what I mean? Not at all. You know what I mean? Sometimes people get kind of bummed, too, when they hear the meaning. Or it's like when they see a video for a a band playing the song because it's in your head what keeps you into it is sure it's the memory yeah, you create own, right absolutely you have your own artistic interpretation of what the song is about but stand up yeah there's nothing so give me some like do you have any random stories between stay asleep and invitation to tragedy that happened on the road um sure huh, of course like anything you want to talk about it doesn't have to be it could just be something um, you're like this is this is really funny or this was fucking crazy or i got electrocuted in key west it's a great story. Okay. We were on tour with um, Cooter. Was it Cooter at that time? Um, and I went to use a payphone, and the payphone electrocuted me, and my whole body shook. I kid you not. And I screamed, fell to the ground, and some lady came over to help me. And she's like, oh, my God, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, that fucking phone just electrocuted me. And she goes, I told them this morning that that was happening. She's like, it happened to me too. So I go back to the hotel room and I tell Tom, well, here comes fucking lawyer Tom. Goes down to the front desk and Tom's like, you know, you just, you know, you just electrocuted my drummer and I feel we should be compensated. And she's like, okay, well, we'll give you three days free for the hotel. And Tom goes, that's not enough. So we got to stay there for free for three days and Cooter got to stay there for free for three days. Wow. And I suffered for it. <laughs> <laughs> it shook my whole body, man. It sucked. And all I think all I'm thinking is like, I'm gonna have a seizure. I'm gonna have a seizure. I'm gonna fucking go nuts here. I was gonna say that's not the best thing to happen to a guy who has seizures. 
I always told Tom he shouldn't have been in a band. He should have been a lawyer because he's pretty. He's pretty witty. He's good. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't want to fuck with Tom Petta. Like, no. He's nope. Tom is just like he I knows won exactly. One, in, my, in my eyes, I won one argument with him. One. Which one was that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't remember. But all I could, all I did was I walked away. I was like, yes, I finally won. I beat him. <laughs> What he was got it? all the money. I didn't get anything. What, what, <laughs> what was it like when you guys were in the van going from spot to spot? Like, what was that dynamic like? Um, like going back for like between like when Josh and John were in the band okay, and then um, like with like. What was it like? It was yeah. great. It was fun. Um, I'll never forget one time we were in a downtown city, probably Jacksonville. And John looked out the window and John goes, I wonder what it would be like to be like them. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? He's like, look at that guy over there wearing that suit and tie. He's like, what do you think it'd be like to be like him? And I'm like, I don't know, probably shitty. I'm like, I like what we're doing. He's like, yeah, I agree. And it was just kind of neat. It like brought us back to like, wow, we're, we're doing it. We're doing something. Yeah. We're not sitting home nine to five. And, and my thing, my thing is this, is like all my friends know that like I didn't make any money from Big Wig. And they always said, Matt, why are you doing it? And I'll tell you why, Mike. I did it because I finally found something that I just loved. I loved doing. I loved the music. I believed in it. And I was painting houses. And I was like, you know what? I can always come back home and paint houses. Okay? That was 1996. Okay? Fast forward to 2020. Guess what I still do? Yeah. Paint houses. Okay? They're still there. They're still... I'm not really working now painting. That's why I'm able to get this <laughs> interview in quick. Um... But I'm, I'm relying on drum lessons, thank God. But, you know, and it was like, that's why. I'm like, you know what? Because I, I can sacrifice my life. And I'll never forget my cousin, who I was really close with, died while we were on tour. We were in Oregon. And Jim Cherry, God rest his soul, goes, why don't you just fly home? And I'm like, I can't fly home. I'm like, that shit ain't going to fly with Big Wig. They're not going to let me. You know what I mean? So I miss, I miss birthdays, weddings, funerals. All, you know, I'm sure with you, it's, it's tour. It's like being in the military. You, you don't go home. You know what I mean? That shit don't happen. Not with our band. It didn't. That wasn't allowed. Christ, we weren't allowed to eat at Taco Bell. We were allowed to have sex before a show. <laughs> I don't care. Fuck it. I'm letting it out now. <laughs> it took like an hour and a half. You're like, here it comes. Were you kind of defeated a little bit? Like when you're when Jim's like, just fly home. You're like, dude, what? No, because that, that was the part where we were really starving. That, that, that was our first bus tour. And there was 13 of us on a bus that fits 12 oh, wow. and I, I was I was smart I was like I'll take the back lounge so I was able to have the whole black back lounge by myself you know what I mean yeah but it was weird I love strung out and I'll never forget when we kind of started to try to hang out in the back lounge um it was almost like they were trying to kick us out and, and Tom or one of them was like no Matt's sleeping back there you just can't kick him out you know what I mean but yeah I, th I thought it I thought it would ha have happened a little bit better and it did you know it took us time to get some you know what I mean? But, but okay. You know, so I real quick, I've always sure. wanted, there's two things I've always wanted to do in a band. I never got to do like one play a giant show with people singing back songs that like I wrote, like my band wrote, you know, sure. like, we never got that with Lane Mar. We got it in a small, in a small way when we played a reunion show, which was fucking awesome. I like, I loved it, but I never got to play like that 15,000 person show. Like you were talking about in the beginning of this with, with less than Jake when Chris was like, yeah, there's that many people out there. And I never got to tour on a bus or even just be on a bus as I was going from one fucking city to the other. Like, did you find being on a bus was as cool as I think it is? Fuck yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. God damn it. Yep. After, <laughs> when, I, when I hooked up, this could be a conversation down the line with the Ataris. And yeah, you want to know behind a, there should be a VH1 behind the music on that band. That's for sure. Yeah. I heard about that. Oof. That was some woo, chaos. Yeah. Love it. Bring it. <laughs> Oh yeah. Was, yeah, I got a little. You know who Motley Crue is? <laughs> Not as bad, but pretty intense. Yeah, I got a little bit of a behind the scenes. From Johnny. Yeah. yeah, he was like, he, 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 I think I could say this, and he, I'm not gonna say what he told me, but he was like, yeah, there's some stuff I left out. And I was like, do tell. And he told me, I was like, wow, oh, dude. He's like, yeah, yeah that, was, that was interesting. I was like, shit. My first show with them was live on MTV. They called me on a Friday night, and Mike Davenport, the bass player, goes. Can you go on tour as a drum tech? I go, what? I'm, he's like, can you go on tour with a drum tech? Talking all quick. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm like, I'm like, I, I don't even know. I'm like, uh, uh, you know what I mean? And I'm like, you know what? Fight with my girlfriend. Let me call you back in 20 minutes. He's like, we need to know now. 
I call him back in 20 minutes. I go, when do I leave? Nice. <laughs> so I fly. He's like, you're flying out on Sunday. Your first show is live on MTV with us and good Charlotte. Be prepared. Oh my God. I was scared shitless. Mike, I didn't know how to tune drums. Well, that was the beginning of you creating a career as being a drum. Yes. Tech. That's yep. how that's how it starts, man. Like my buddy Bob, he became a cameraman in like helicopters one day. He was working for before he was working for CNN. They were like, "Can you uh, work a camera in a helicopter?" He's like, "Yeah." And he's like, "I don't know the fuck I was doing." And then he did yeah. it. and He made a career out of it. I think people in the moment, it like that is that moment where you're asked it, or you're asked, and you have enough of a foundation, but you're going, "I haven't done it, but I I know." kind of about it you're like i can fake it you're like well (laughs) the people asking you they don't know how to fucking do it so you're going to obviously do way better than them so you're like sure then just fucking send me home if i suck the funny thing about that is a security guard was looking at me big huge security guard he's looking at me and i notice he's watching me and he comes over and he goes you're having a little bit of problems aren't you i'm like i go this is my first time doing this as a drum tech i don't know how to tune drums he goes give them to me i'll take care of you (laughs) <laughs> and he tuned him for me. No way. <laughs> yeah, the security guard. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so fucking cool. But, you know, like things show up, man. They just show up and you're like, you're in the moment. Like someone's always there to help you if you like really yeah. are looking for it. Now let's, let's talk about, so, okay, stay asleep. We went from stay asleep. Then we're at Invitation to Tragedy. And so that's 2001 when that comes out, um, as, as says Spotify. Now, what year was it that you and big wig parted ways uh 2002 i'm almost positive yeah most likely 2002 yeah were jeremy and max still in the band at that point no after um um let me think who left first did they leave at the same time uh did jeremy say anything about this in his interview i think he did but this was like again this was okay a year and a half ago i I I know he he split and they did near miss and then i don't know if you were still in the band but like um, but I was still it, yeah. in the band, and Max. Let's just say Max and Jeremy both left around the same time, and um, that's when they moved to Texas. Yes. And then, in after that, we got Josh, uh, Josh Marsh from Overdrives, obviously, mm-hmm. and then uh, Brent. And Brent used to tour with us years ago. Um, when I first got in Big Wig, he kind of, you know, was like a tech for us for a little bit. He came on the road and whatever, and had fun. That guy's fucking hilarious, Brent. Holy shit! I don't know who he. Is. I don't think I ever met a, him. Oh, he's just a one man comedic show. But, um, and I was, I was in, I was in the band with Brent and Josh for a, a little bit. And then that's when, you know, things happened with big wig and I, and so what happened? Know. Like, what was the split? Um, what was the split as far as how did you, how did it end with you? Being I got fired. Yeah, whatever. Was I it at fired. a show? Was it on? No, like... what it was. Um, I remember perfectly. I called up how did it go? I called up Tom and I go, yeah, I'm just checking in to see when we're going to have practice. He goes, you haven't talked to, to Brent or Josh. I go, no. He goes, well, he's like, you're not in the band anymore. I'm like, what do you mean you're not in the band anymore? He's like, ah, you know, Matt, he's like, you've been a pain in the ass to deal with. And he's like, we just feel that if big week wants to continue, it'd be best without you. Like some sort of line like that. And you know what? It was money. I don't care. He wanted my percentage. Cause I was making money then, you know, you can keep this. I don't give a shit. Like I was making a certain percent. I took, it took me five years to make any money in that band. And then after, for the last, the next the last two years, I started making money. And I think Tom was pissed off when he had to pay me at night. And he, he would grunt handing me money. He'd grunt handing me money. And he'd be like, uh, uh, uh. so I, I sign a bullshit contract. I get fired three months later and Tom gets part of my percentage. And also I had to sign off all of my, not that I ever got a royalty check, but my royalties from Big Wig. So I'm not even part of Big Wig if you think about it legally that way. So what? So when that happens, you know, you kind of alluded to it earlier. We we're talking. You said like that just really bummed you the fuck out. Yeah, especially when I did those. Especially when I did those shows with with Tom, you know, a few years back. Because I said to Tom when we parted ways, I was like, man, let's do Big Wig again. Let's do this. I'm like, the guitar player lives in. Um, what is it? Rhode Island. I'm like, Tom. And I told Tom and I stood there and I said, I will drive two or three hours one way. Paul can come two or three hours and we'll rehearse on our own. We'll write songs. Let's do this. Let's do big wig. He's like, yeah, let's, let's talk about this. I was willing to sacrifice four to six hours of me driving round trip for big wig. And I wanted to write a new record. I wanted to write songs. I wanted to play with Tom again because I love his style. 
I love his voice, but I hate his attitude. I always said he's a, he's, he's a punk rock guitar player with a metalhead attitude. It was money. I don't care, whatever. It's money. It was all about money. He got it. I didn't. Did you, which, what time period was this though when you wanted to do that? Was this between Invitation to Tragedy and Reclamation? Or was this yeah. after Reclamation? Yeah. And I'm bummed I didn't get to record Reclamation. Some of those songs are fucking killer. <laughs> um, yeah. Because, um, well, John and after me, Josh and Brent quit. And then John and then Tom got some other guy. Like I said, actually, I think there was 17 different members when I was in Big Wig for seven years. Wow. I have listed in front of me nine definites. But I think Tom and I tried out eight more. There's I for some reason I remember the number seventeen, but um we had wow. John Josh Rivers Tony Lasardo Jeremy Max Brent Josh Marsh and John Grasso, who you wouldn't know nobody would know we didn't play a show with John but we re- we rehearsed with him but he was in the band I think Josh would know Josh was he knew he remembered a lot and his story was funny too because he talked about I said I was like how did you quit I like didn't you like you you like lost a finger or some shit and he goes no well, that was all a lie yeah and he goes i would lied he goes i like lied that i broke my arm or something like that and i just couldn't play anymore or something i was like wow well tom wanted to rent these huge rvs and and, and i know where josh was going and it was like we rented an rv one show we drove from new jersey down to somewhere in florida to play live on this like with the sports network show Dude, Mike, we played in front of eight people. Tom probably got paid. We didn't, obviously. And we played another show in Jacksonville and drove home. Wow. Can you imagine how much it costs to drive an RV? Because Tom wanted to rent this RV to make it look good. We're gonna make. We're gonna pull up. We're gonna look professional. We're gonna get out. Meanwhile, we're all scummy and dirty. But look at this nice RV they have. And and that getting back to a Josh. Josh's theory was. We're going to rent this RV. We're going to spend $10,000 on the RV. I'm not going to make any money. I'm going to come home and be broke. Yeah. And you know what? Mac, getting back with Max, Max that he moved his whole livelihood and didn't make anything. Yeah. Didn't make anything. And I'll say it. We did a, we did a Canadian tour. Max leans up in the front seat and goes, Tom Petta, I don't have any money for cigarettes. I need money. After a two-month tour, we're driving down 87. <sighs> you hear Tom go like that. All right, I'll give you each 20 bucks. So he hands us 20 bucks. Me, 20 bucks. Jeremy, 20 bucks. Max, 20 bucks. We pull into Jeremy's house. Everybody's getting out, getting in their cars. Tom goes, you know what, guys? We have bills to pay. I need that 20 bucks back. We had to give him back our 20 bucks. For two months, we made nothing. Oh, he yelled at John one time for zippering his zipper too loud. When I was in the band with John, uh, with, this was a, a Max... This was Max and Jeremy era. And we played with, it was a no use for a name tour. And we played at the Stone Pony. And the show got over and I drove back to Pennsylvania. So we get a, I get a phone call at like 8 a.m. And it's the booking agent. He's like, Matt, where are you? I'm like, I'm in Pennsylvania. He's like, well, you guys have a show in Boston today at one o'clock. He's like, Tom is freaking out at home. I'm like, what are you talking about? Tom didn't tell me. I know we're playing in Boston. I'm like, we don't have to leave for like three or four. And he's like, no, you play at one o'clock. So I rush to New Jersey, to Jeremy's house. I get there. Who's not there? Tom. We wait two to three hours. Tom shows up, gets out of his car, and he goes, you fucked up to me. I go, fuck you. I go, we could have made it. Where the fuck were you? And he grabbed me. He grabbed me. And I thought he was going to punch me. And I'm like, this is it. This is when it goes, this is when it goes down. And he didn't hit me. I think Jeremy and Max or any more Max grabbed him off of me. And what's weird about that day is somehow things calmed down. And I spent a good hour talking to our booking agent who knew Tom was getting all the money and said, now everyone in the band will be issued um, tour, tour programs. So you know where you're going to be and what time all the shows are. Because Tom didn't let us know. It was all secret. We didn't know how much we made. We didn't know this. It was all secretive. Shh, don't tell the band. Don't tell anybody. It was all secret. We couldn't know. Have you ever like talked to him face-to-face about this out loud? Or is this like something that this, no, you never said? But I, like I said, I let it go. Oh, and getting back to the whole thing with me telling Tom, 
no, you can keep all this. Okay. Me telling Tom years ago when I was ready to get back with Big Week because I was like, I love it. And, and I just, I, I, there's a part I love with Tom. You know what I mean? I do. But it just, I was ready to sacrifice that. And I was ready. And it was like, this is great. I told my wife, I'm, she was so excited for me. My kid was excited. And he was like, good, you get to do this something that you love so much again. And then they go to fucking Canada and they hire some French fuck to play drums in front of like 40,000 people. And I'm like, what the fuck happened to me? And I'm like, why did they do that? I got left in the dirt again. Fuck. <laughs> why? Why? I was willing to drive. I bet you that French fuck wouldn't drive six hours round trip for a brand practice. I would have done it for free. I would have done it for free because I just wanted to play with Tom again. I just wanted to play with a band and something that I believed in. And I totally feel that we could have rekindled some spirit, some song. And once again, getting back to the earlier conversation here between you and I, Tom and I could write a song in a week. Yeah. Oh, we Freegan. I think you talked to Tom about Freegan. Free, we wrote Freegan in five minutes. Done over and done five minutes. Like, do you still feel that, you know, from this whole story and everything you talked about, like, do you feel like to this day, cause Tom's going to hear this and oh, yeah, okay. are you guys still like, do you guys, I mean, obviously you played with the, the Boston shows and stuff like that. Like if he reached out to you after this, I was like, Hey dude, what the fuck? Like you guys, do you guys have like a friendship where that's not going to get tarnished or it's all business. I feel like I got punched in the face constantly with, with that band and, and hear me out on Tom's side. I'll stick up for Tom towards the end of the band. I started like I would be like I I lied I'd be like I got this wedding I can't do that show I got this birthday this funeral this I started lying to Tom left and right because you know what Mike I wasn't getting paid why should I feed his pocket I, I, I'm gonna drive four hours to New Jersey play in front of a thousand people drive four hours back all right maybe that's an exaggeration four hours total round trip have the Time of my life for 45 minutes, not have a t I shit up like Tom did, okay? And fucking not get paid after six years, after five years, six years? No, I wasn't doing it. I'm gonna stay back home and have fun and hang out with my friends, you know? So I lied a lot towards the end, you know what I mean? And that might be, that might be why I got fired too, because he probably, you know, but I wasn't getting paid. You know what I mean? Like, and that, when I did start, it was probably the last year and a half I was getting paid. I have no problem saying the most I ever got paid with Big Week was $675 for one show. And when Tom handed me that $675, he grunted the whole fucking time doing it. Why did Big Week have uh, 17 different members? Oh, that's why. Why did Carter and Tom have that issue? Oh, because Carter and Tom butted heads. I went along, the first few years, I just, I just went along with it. Once again, what am I going to go home, go back home and paint houses? I have closure. Once, once again, once my wife and son saw me play with Big Wig and saw what I helped create, I had closure. I was like, I'm going to step out of this. Well, well, I had closure and I said, if this is it, then that's it. I'm okay. But I still said to Tom, I still want to do this. I want to write songs. Please. I'm begging you. Then he hires some French fuck to do that show with Rise Against. Did you find that like when you got like let go from the band, you got fired from the band and then you went off to do the drum teching stuff. Like, did you at one point go, ah, uh, this is, this is way better. Yes. Um, I, I told you, uh, I bawled my eyes out. I cried. I was like, do I commit suicide? It got really bad with, with me. And, uh, four days later I woke up and it was like a breath of fresh air. And I go, wait a minute, this is fucking awesome. And I had a great, not even a year, and within that year, the Ataris, you know, go into, you know, transfer to the Ataris. I'm on tour, and the day that I got fired from Bigwig was the day I was landing back home into the United States from an Australian New Zealand tour with the Ataris. So Bigwig is done, and your first band you went on tour with drum teching was the Ataris. Yes. So you stayed with them, and then eventually led to Starting Line, who you've been with for a decade. Uh, 2005 to now. So what is that? For, uh, I don't know. What are we in? 15 years? 15 years? Yeah. Oh my God. It's so like how, I'm married to them. How, how long were you? <laughs> I didn't even know they were still touring. I know that Kenny has their yeah. band. Yeah. He does vacation and we did, uh, we did, um, they did a 20 year, uh, anniversary bunch of shows this, this summer, which was just, just I, epic. I, I mean, didn't just, realize they were that big. I knew they were on 
uh, they had that song Island come out, which I love that song or that love, record. I love, um, oh man, when I heard that, I was on a plane and we were flying somewhere and I screamed on the plane because I always wanted to go to Japan. Holy shit, I'm going to fucking Japan. And everybody turns around and looks at me because I thought that song was going to hit. Yeah. And you know what sucks? And it should have. And it's a beautiful song. And um, I think what it was was that band they call Fall Out Boy kind of, you know. The, the got, band they took, call Fall Out Boy. Yeah. Kind of took the reins on that. I mean, you know. And, it, and it's, you know what? The starting line, I don't know if I said this when we first started talking with the interview the other day. Those guys are 100% heart. Kenny, Kenny Vasoli is you know what i man he just he's he's all music he's all heart i i don't know if i said this before like i said i remember we were in maine and uh this is back when they were touring a lot and i go what's the count tonight kenny what do we got going on in there he's like i don't know i'll play in front of five thousand people i'll play in front of five i don't care i just want to play damn and i was like i love him do you know what i mean and and like they're all just great guys there's never a fight 15 years I never heard them fight. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, I never heard them fight. Ever. They kind of remind me. I feel like they, Kenny seems, I don't really know Ace, um, Ace Enders. I feel like he know Ace. You know what I'm talking about, right? No, I don't. I got to tell you, I'm sorry. Ace, Ace Enders from early November. Like he's, he, Barker from Landmark when he was in Day at the Fair, he toured with those guys and he was like, he was like the nicest dude. I think, I feel like Kenny and him seem like they have like the same, this is obviously a guess based on just hearsay, but it seems like they were both just super fucking nice dudes who were truly into it for just like the love of it. Yeah. yeah. Again, again, this is me guessing. It's like me. I thought you might've known him, but I just think think sometimes in the, in the music industry, there are people where they're like, I think at the same time too, there is that nice buffer where you're getting paid to do it and you can, I think sure. it, oh, give, yeah. it can give you a little breathing room and right. it, it makes yeah. it easier to say shit like that. But I think some people are like, yeah, I mean, I think there'd be a time where they're going, we can't do this anymore because we can't get paid, but it's, right. we would love to play in front of 5,000, but we could still do it in front of five and like, sure. it'd still be amazing. Yeah. I mean, and you know what, like the starting line guys, they're, they're all, they're, they're friends. I mean, they're, they're just, they're just great great guys and, and i seriously like thinking back 15 years i seriously never seen them fight and i was there constantly with them surrounding with them you know what i mean i mean not while they're recording or shit like that but they were they were touring we did like a six month tour once it was pretty pretty heavy duty did you get to live that life like the the life that you because i talked about this with josh when he was in overdrives and then he went into big wig he he had mentioned when he first saw Big Week, you guys play, he was like, man, we got to be like this band. And then all of a sudden he was in the band and he got to live this life where he was touring and got to, you know, in his head what he wanted, he envisioned what it was going to be like. He got to do it. And with you, you know, being in the band it didn't work out for you fi- financially, but then you got to be on tour with these other bands where, yeah, you weren't playing drums, but you got to witness those giant fucking shows. Like, was did you feel like you got that thing that you were looking for? Oh uh, yeah, I I live vicariously. I told Tom, Tom from the starting line, love us. Oh, he's just great. He's he's awesome. I love him. And I tell him every night, I'm like, I live vicariously through you. Don't fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, you know what I mean. And when I was with the Ataris, I actually had to play with the Ataris a couple times. And um, you know, like in Ireland, I had to play with them, jump up, and I didn't know the songs. And they're like, you've got four hours to learn the songs. You're still going to drum tech. You got to set up your own drums, but King can't play tonight. You have to play. Oh, wow. So in Ireland, I had to pick up and then uh, we played with Ludacris, that band <laughs> yeah. in um, o- Orlando. We played the, a pretty huge show. The rapper? Yeah. <laughs> oh, the starting line? We played with Snoop Dogg. Jesus uh, Christ. We played with the Red Hot Chili Peppers in Germany with uh, the Ataris. Any 90s basic band that you can think of, the starting line played with. Wow. I mean, Fuel, Three Days Grace, Audio Slave, Smashing Pumpkins. For all the three bands, I'm looking at my thing now. Um, geez, all, you know, Snoop Dogg. We did a thing with Snoop Dogg. Uh, I'm looking at all my tour laminates and all the bands. Yeah, I'm looking, 90s bands. I'm looking at <laughs> I'm looking through your photos on your on your on um, Facebook, and there's this one where it's like you taking a photo from behind Kenny, I believe, and it's just out on a boat. Was that one of those? Oh yeah, we cruises? did the cruise. That's yeah, we crazy. did the uh, the Warp Tour cruise, and they were nice enough to bring me along on the Warp Tour cruise. It was like 2003 Warp Tour music 
and it was, it was amazing. Face to face, ah, oh, face to face, good Charlotte, uh, simple plan. Um, oh my God, I can't think right now. There's so many great, uh, Bowling for Soup. Um, uh, it, it was awesome. It was great. It was freaking awesome. It was a cruise to Mexico with all these wow. awesome bands. That's so you know I mean? fucking amazing. I, I got paid to go on vacation. <laughs> Shit. You can't get better than that. Thanks, starting line. I think like I, through this podcast, I am or I know that I'm vicariously living through people that I'm interviewing. Just being like, man, <laughs> that sounds well, so fucking amazing. I live vicariously through people who still do it and everything like that because – I mean, there's, there's so many people that I know that still do it. Like, you know, I mean, they're working with the one, you know, the dude from the reunion show, Brian Diaz, man, he, he, he worked with Guns N' Roses, wow. you know, I'm not even a Guns N' Roses fan, but I can't even imagine what the paycheck would be. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. You know, Yo, I know what yeah. the starting line give me and they, they take care of me like I'm their family and I can't imagine what Guns N' Roses would pay their tech. Do you, you ever know? like, do you ever want to, I mean, yeah, I'm going to ask it. I'm guessing the answer is no, but do you ever want to like find another band? Um, well, uh, currently I'm playing with a, a hardcore band called Antidote and it's like an early New York hardcore band and we don't play too much. Um, we are playing with Mr. Bungle actually. I don't know what? if you remember Mr. Yes, Bungle. Yeah, we're yes. doing the Mr. Bungle show in Brooklyn. Oh my um, God. And then, um, I play with a band called the Drew Stone Hit Squad and it's like, um, you know, it's like acoustic stuff. We have a violin player. Oh, actually, we have Kate from the Pogues and Elvis Costello plays with us. Jesus Christ. And um, we, we don't play too often, but um, the singer of that band, he actually does movies, and I'll plug him a little bit. His name's Drew Stone, and he does um, – you ever see that movie, Who the Fuck is That Guy? The Fabulous Journey of Michael Alago. It's on, like, Netflix and Amazon Prime. No. Oh, Interesting movie. Well, my singer did that. He's like an independent film, film, film guy, and everything like that. How did you get and, hooked uh, up? With, wait, how did you get hooked up with all of this band? Um, with that band, well, he was a, he's the singer of Antidote, and I would go see Antidote a bunch of times. I just got talking to him, and I was like, "You ever need a drummer? Let me know." And you know, it happened. And um, and then he's like, "Hey, I'm doing this acoustic thing. You want to jump in? And we're gonna do like pop, folk songs and punk songs." So. You know, I, I, you know, I'm doing that with the, with them. Not too much, you know what I mean? And then, like I said, we got Kate from the Pogues. Elvis Costello plays bass. Um, we got the a guy from uh, this guy, Tristan, who plays. He's with the Undead. And uh, this guy, Nadi, who plays violin with us. And it's it's pretty cool. See, like, you know, I, that's... I, I love, I, I just have this, like, I, I'm I'm happy that things worked out for you because you just always such a, a such a great guy. Like, I I don't know from from an outside perspective like you were you were always just like super happy super energetic just super fucking nice and then you know you got to live that life of playing in big wig for a while and playing drums and then you got to you know jump in drum tech which took care of you where I think it might have maybe been a little less stressful because you were like wow I get to actually hit, sit here and make some cash and breathe and do this new thing which is challenging and like I'm learning a lot about and going with these bands. And then, like, right. you know, then years later, I mean, how long have you been with your wife? Uh, oh, God, you're going to go there. Uh, four, <laughs> four, 14 years. Funny story about my wife. I got her pregnant in three months of knowing her. Oh, my God. She didn't know how to spell my last name. By the way, my last name is G-R-A-Y. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know how to spell my last name. She thought it was E-Y. She was pregnant with my kid. Well, our kid. Did she meet you? Yeah. Did you guys meet on tour? Or did you meet in Pennsylvania? Uh, a friend of a friend. And, um, and, um, she was living in Long Island and I'm a country boy in Pennsylvania and I got her pregnant in three months and I was like, Oh fuck. And, um, I was like, well, here's what we can do. I can move you to Pennsylvania and I have a big family support. I'm big on family or I can move out to Long Island and it's me, you and our kid. Obviously we didn't know what it was. Thank God she moved to Pennsylvania because I'm not a Long Island guy. That's for sure. That's incredible. Like you guys just hit it off right from the beginning and, yep. and that's awesome. I mean, yep. we, that's a, we made it through the rain. That was our song for Barry Manilow. That was our song for our dance. We made it through the rain. And let me tell you, we really did. She's a hairdresser and she was modeling in Long Island. And I hate it when people say she's mod she was a legit model. She was doing like she was she did a Fredericks of Hollywood catalog. And um like shoot and everything like that. And um she was actually six months pregnant. She did runway at six months pregnant. Oh my God. Um, yeah, she used to more runway shit. But anyway, so she was busy tied up with all that shit. 
And then like when I moved her to Pennsylvania, that all just obviously fizzled out. I was so. going to say, I was like, that's, you gotta be pretty amazing. That if you went, get someone to move to, bye -bye. yeah, you get to move to butt fuck Pennsylvania. Yeah. Well, I'm a nice guy, Mike. You know, come on. It's true. You know, that, that's, it's, that's, you know, I, once again, I always, I love talking to people. You can tell, you know, I'm, I'm I've always, I don't care who you are, what you are. I love people. And that's how, you know, not everybody's like that. Everybody has their own personality. My dad's not, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, you know? it just seems, it seems to me like there, there's people that I interview where I try to learn a little bit from them. I'm almost like not everyone, I don't think everyone wakes up and it's just sunshine and rainbows and shit all the time. But I think some people, majority of it is, but like talking to you, talking to Mike Park, uh, I was talking like Vinny from Less Than Jake, um, you know, Brendan from Slapstick. I think there's certain people that just realized what they wanted to do, what they wouldn't stray from. And it was it wasn't about the money. It was about the thing they were doing, and then the money came. Um, sure. And you know, and not like in some people it came in giant waves, and some people it's like, hey, I can sustain with this, or I get to do what I get to do. But I get these moments where, like, you get to go up and play drums for a couple songs with these in front of these giant crowds, or you got to tour and things like that. And I think like that's the piece that I've been missing recently is just I'm going, I'm trying so hard to go after just making money where I'm. I'm trying to like go back and be like, what is it I really love? And I'm just very right. envious of people uh, that that just stuck with, well, this is what I love to do, and I'm not going to stray from this. And then they're like, wow, this cool shit started to happen. You know, I got like sure. a cool life, and I'm living where I want to. And great, like I said, and you had mentioned some shit has been happening over like four months or whatever. And you know, it's never like that. It's all you know, you're not like looking at someone in the movies or like, wow, they're just life so perfect, but. It just like I like seeing people who are having fun with it. Sure, and yeah. That, um, and then and things work out, or it like looks like they're working out. It was kind of perfect timing with when I was having my child. It was like 2000. Well, my child Anakin was born. That's my kid. Yep. In 2006, and it was 2008, and that's when the starting line were breaking up. They're like, you know what? Let's let's break up. You know, blah blah blah, and. It, it's good because we were heavily touring for two years and Becky kind of was like, you know, you're missing everything of your son, how to walk, how to talk. And I missed it. Mike, I missed it. Yeah. I missed out a lot. And you know what I mean? I'll never get that back. And it was perfect timing because Becky was starting to give me a little bit of an ultimatum and I could hear it in her voice. And so like, you fucking perfect... moved me to Pennsylvania. You were yeah. coming here and hanging out with me. And you're going on these huge tours with All American Rejects and Paramore, and you're playing with Fall Out Boy, you're playing with freaking Snoop Dogg, and all this, you know, all these crazy huge The Roots, all these bands. Wow. And um, you know, it was perfect. And then you know, over the years, starting line would do shows here and there, but like I said, this this past summer, it was just I was just so graced with being able to go back out on the road with them. And then last year, or was it two years ago, that Warp Tour cruise they took me on. And, and you know what? It was great. They didn't have to take me. They, they didn't, you know, Tom could have set up his own drums, but it was just, it was awesome that they, they included me with them. With yeah. That. Well, I mean, you like know. you're like the fifth member, basically. Yeah. Well, I don't want, you know, well, they have a fifth member. Well, I mean, like they have like the road, the, you know, they, there's a lot of members, right. but you're like, you, you know, you're, there is something to just going back and be like, it, it worked this way. Sure. Why would we not do this? And yeah. if the, if the show's gonna be that gigantic, that, that is pretty cool. They're like, well, a slice of the pie is going to go to this guy, but it's going to be worth it. Right. And that's, that's how they are too. They're very, they're very generous with, with, you know, with pay me. I just got paid the last week with the Christmas shows that they did. And I was like, fucking awesome. <laughs> Holy shit. How many big wig shows would I have to do to be able to make that money? <laughs> 10, 20. <laughs> I always thought when a couple of years ago, I was like, man, I should, because I'm my main thing that I do is like making content, like video content, or I do graphic design and shit like that. And I was like, I would love to go on tour with a band and just be like, I'll be the guy who's just running all of your content. Like I'm just taking videos and making animations and shit like that. I was like, just for the just for the chance to be on the road and witness this lifestyle. And then there's like a part of me that's I, I'm sure if I reached out to enough bands, be like, hey man, like I'll make my own way, or if you want to throw me a couple bucks, I'll do this just to get that experience. But then I'm like, I just turned 40 in May, and I'm like, I feel like I would get tired. I'm like, Absolutely. I was Absolutely. like, oh, God, I'm, why am I being so old right now? I'm not. <laughs> you see it with the bands that still tour and some of my friends. That, like I saw this one, my one friend in, uh, over the summer with this whole starting line 20-year anniversary tour, 
I'm like, how you doing, man? He's like, oh, I'm all right. Still torn heavily. I'm on my second marriage. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course you are. Yeah. <laughs> of course. You know, we had um, with the Ataris, I think it was, it was like Bon Jovi's sound guy we had working with us. And I think he was getting a divorce and everything like that. It's oh, like, yeah. well, you bounce from Bon Jovi to the Ataris and you're on tour all the time. It's you're like gonna you, get, you're gonna get divorced. You can't go to the amusement it's park. Tough. You can't go to the amusement park. Go on all the roller coasters. Get this thrill, and then do it every fucking day. Because eventually, you're like, this is just old. I think yeah. it's nice to to be able, if you have the ability to do it, or you could just jump into something for a small amount of time to get it, and then go back and have that balance of your regular life. If people can figure that out, it's great. But they go too far in. I was like, man, I really, when we were in Landmark, I was like, I really wanted that to work. And I, and at 20 years old, I'm thinking like, I want to do this when I'm 40. Now that I am 40, I'm going, I am so glad that that shit ended when it ended. I, I sure. wish, I wish we could have played a couple shows here and there, like Bamboozle or, or Skate and Surf and like been asked to, to play where people really wanted us to. And then that would be my outlet. Right. But I wouldn't want to be doing that all the time. I'm like, I don't understand how you guys can live like this. It's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough life. And, and, um, I, I actually, for me personally, I felt I had the best job in the world as a drum tech, especially when I got with the Ataris. Like I said, I was fighting with my girlfriend and I, I, I just took off. <laughs> Two days later, I was I was on tour. I was like, no turning back. And I was like, this is freaking awesome. I'm like, they're going to take me all over the world. You know what I mean? And I'm going to get paid to do it. And it was great because like, I wasn't in love with my my girlfriend at that point. You know what I mean? But, you know, I was like, this is, I have nothing to hold me back. What am I going to? Go tour Europe, Australia, New Zealand, you know, over U.S., Canada, or come home and paint a house. Mm, let me think about that one. <laughs> yeah, which wouldn't sound I'm more just going to come back and paint some houses. You know what I mean? Once yeah. again, what am I doing now? Drum lessons and painting houses. So, um, And I miss it. I miss it. Like I said, I, I was glad that the starting line took me out this past summer. And uh, I, I miss it. I do. Yeah, I can imagine. And I'm sure that like when you're out, you're like, okay, I'm getting a little burned out now, maybe. Not well, we didn't do too much. It was more like weekend one-off type shows and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. But if it was longer, you think you'd get a little burned out? I now I got smart on tour. I used to um, I would bring a bike and I'd put a bike in the back of the trailer and I'd wake up early in the morning. Now early for me is ten o'clock, <laughs> and I I go bike around the city, man. I go That's explore. Cool. I'm the guy. I go. I would do so much cheesy shit. That's awesome. I, I, you know, I would do everything. We were in Rome with the Ataris and we played somewhere in Rome and, um, uh, we went back to the hotel cause we were only in Rome for like 10 hours and our guitar tech horse, which is a whole other story. I can't even love horse, but anyway, horse walks out of the dressing room. We got all these girls in the dressing room. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, I'm going to the Roman Coliseum. He's like, I may never be here ever again. And I go, you know what? I'll split the cab with you. Now it was night. And let me tell you, Two coolest things I've ever seen in my life. First was the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life was my son being born. The second coolest thing in my life was being in a taxi with horse driving up to the Roman Coliseum. It is just breath fucking taking. It's amazing. I mean, we could we didn't get to go inside because it was two in the morning. And guess what? I've never been back to Rome. So I'm glad I did. Expensive cab ride, but we played a fucking World War II bunker in Germany with, with the Ataris. Oh my God, it was so cool. Wait, what was Undergr it? An underground, we played an underground World War II like munitions bunker or some shit like that in Germany. Whoa. Yeah, it was cool. It was that big or it was like a small show? Oh, there were shafts going down this way, shafts going down this way. It was it was all hallways. It was pretty cool, man. Dude, that's amazing. pretty terrifying to know what probably went on in there. Too. That's yeah. I mean, that's like the stuff where I look at my life now, and I, I, there's a I'm I'm not a big fan of flying, and and like I did the travel thing like on a small scale, but there's a piece of me that's like, man, I'm really gonna miss out. Like if I'm 40 now, the the chance, the, you know, you start looking at how many more decades do I have where I'm gonna be very spry and can walk sure. around and do shit. And it's like there's all of these things around the fucking world that I'm gonna miss out on if I'm just like having anxiety about it. But it's like the fact right. that back in the day, you you didn't. It's like subconsciously you're like, I might never fucking come back here again. And it's like you're right. You're like, when am I gonna just take a random trip out there that won't be super expensive and you know not as cool? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's why I decided to draw bring a bike on all the tours. I put it in the back of the trailer 
and every day I wake up and Smart. I go right around the city. And yeah, because you don't get to see yeah, you, you, you never get a chance to see that shit when you're on tour unless you make the the um uh you put some effort into it. Yeah. Oh yeah, and those beginning stages of big week, we, we would get hotels outside of the city. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um I have two important stories I want to tell really quick. It's not sure. talk either. If I can. Absolutely. Back to Big Wig. I really got to tell this story. It's pretty fun. We were on tour with Gob, and we're in Canada. And somehow, Tom, I guess, misplaced the, you know, the tour schedule or whatever. And of course, none of us, we had, we didn't have a copy. So we had the brilliant idea of, well, look at the back of the tour t-shirt. Look at Gob's tour t-shirt. I'm like, I got one. So I pull out the tour, you know, the Gob tour shirt. And we look at it. And we're like, okay, we're in this city. <laughs> so whatever. We get in the car. It's two in the morning, whatever. We're driving. We get in the city, whatever time, we get a hotel. We wake up. So we wake up and I go, this is payphone era. And I go to advance the club, to, you know, get the details and everything. I call, it's like whatever, 10 o'clock, 11 in the morning. And I'm like, hi, my name's Matt. I'm in the band Big Wig. And we're, you know, I'm just calling to advance, you know, the club just to see what's going on for tonight. He's like, excuse me? I'm like, my name's Matt. I'm in Big Wig. We're playing here tonight. He goes, you're not playing here tonight. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you guys aren't scheduled until tomorrow night. I'm like, we're in the wrong fucking city. Oh, no. So I run back to the hotel. I slam open the door. And you never want to slam open the door when you're in a band with Tom Petter. <laughs> Ever. You don't want to make sure you zip that zipper too loud. You'll get yelled at. Okay. And Tom's like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, we're in the wrong city. What do you mean we're in the wrong city? Everybody, get the fuck up. We got to go. We were in the wrong fucking city. Where, where were you and where were you supposed to be? Um, We were only four hours out of the way, so it wasn't that bad. I'm four to six hours from what I remember. Uh, it's written down, but I don't really remember numerically. But it's definitely a good four hours out of the way. I thought you were going to say you were looking at the tour shirt, but it was from like the previous year. Oh, that'd be hilarious. <laughs> That's a good one. Sorry, my story isn't that cool. I don't have that good of stories. <laughs> Wait, what was the second one? You said you had two stories. So, uh, really quick... The, um. So when I was with in Australia, I almost got killed in Australia. So I need to tell this story. I go on. So obviously drum tech with the, with the, um, the Ataris, they're, they're, they're obviously at their height. You know I mean? They're booming. You know what I mean? You, you go into a convenience store and you hear boys of summer on the radio. You know what I mean? Oh, this and, is better. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, we play this, this venue and there's this huge stage and it's just set up and there's gotta be without exaggerating. I don't like exaggerating a good six to eight foot drop. So I'm out, we're partying the night before, of course, the next day is a show. So the drummer kid, he's motioning for me. So I have to climb up a ladder to get on stage to get to him. So I'm climbing up this ladder because I can't hear him. It's fucking loud. And I grab the drum wedge. Guess what? I fall backwards six to eight feet, slam on the ground. The drum wedge hits my leg. Perfectly hits it. To where it doesn't break. That was a 60 to 80 pound wedge. If it would have hit me in the face, it would have smashed my skull open. Oh my God. To this day, there's a spot on my leg where I can't feel any pain. <laughs> if it would have hit me in the face, I would not be here now. I would be dead. I would have killed myself. Wait, what the fuck is the drum wedge? The drum wedge, the drum monitor. You know, like. Oh, the monitor. The drummers. Yeah, the drum monitor, drum wedge. You know what I mean? So I was trying to climb up this ladder to, get, to see oh, what kid needed. Oh, shit. And I, and I grabbed the wedge, and I slipped off the ladder, and I fell back. And it luckily, got, ugh, luckily, it did not hit me anywhere except for my leg, and it did not break a leg. Wow. And really quick to segue to the next story really quick. Yeah. I hooked up with a girl last that night. Turns out to be a hooker. <laughs> yep. Yep. You were rewarded. I'm hooking up with I'm hooking up with this girl and I'm like, you're too good at this. And I'm like, wait a minute. You're a prostitute, aren't you? And she goes, Yeah. <laughs> wait, was this like one where she you she you had met her at a bar and she was like, Okay, I'm gonna get paid or were you she was like, I'm off duty and she was at the show and I'm trying to think how it went down because she helped me back to the hotel room limping. And then the next day, I went to the emergency room, and everything was okay. And then I came back, and she gave me her number, and she took me all over uh, Sydney. Okay. Is that the one? Where's the, the big opera house? Sydney, I think Australia? It's Sydney, yeah. Okay. Yeah, whatever it is. And um, 
you know, and it was cool. We actually spent a couple of days together, so it was kind of interesting. All I'm thinking is like fucking Bruno is going to be busting that door down and being like, you owe me a thousand dollars. So that went from almost getting killed to almost getting killed again, I guess, maybe by, I don't know, a pimp? No, I don't know. By, by, by a pimp. <laughs> I hope my wife never listens to this. So. I, I really hope that, and I am going to close this out, but I hope, I think what would be cool if you had no shame and depending on the story is to just take your journal and fucking somehow publish that, like put that out or just pick certain stories and just ha- put that out. Cause you could do it yourself. I know, but it wouldn't, you know, in all honesty, it's, it's my, yeah, nobody, I don't think anybody would be really be interested. You know I'm what I mean? It's just fun to sure. shop talk about it. Dude, I have a, I have a fucking podcast of the late nineties punk scene and it started off talking in Jersey and there was an audience for it. I'm pretty sure there's an, a Matt Gray audience out there that wants to hear like stories from the rogue. I mean, everyone loves that shit. I remember years ago, there was a video that came out. It was basically, uh, um, wh- who are the uh, like groupies? It was like groupies telling stories about like fucking Vince Neil and Axl Rose and like blowing up the scene. And you're like, I was like, Oh man, I was like, I gotta, I gotta read that fucking book. It's like Motley Crue's the dirt. That book's insane. Yeah. Oh, that's, oh yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't, once getting back to Utah, it wasn't like that crazy chaotic, but I mean, it was definitely a tip of that. You know, there was a chunk of that rock and roll era with, with that band. That's for sure. You know what I mean? As far as huge shows and just, just there was, there was groupie, there was chicks and it was just, it was fucking whatever. Oh, maybe. Brand. I don't know. I mean, I know how to, I know how to self publish. So maybe I'll do like a, this was the scene published book of the Matt Gray, like little short story, like tiny book. It'd just be like, Ten stories, just a nobody would hand-pick. be interested. But that's a thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Did Josh Marsh tell the pepper spray story about me? I don't. I got pepper spray on my dick. He, I heard the gold bomb story. The gold right, bomb story tell, about putting one on more the story. Balls. Yeah. You don't have to post it. That's all right. You know. Oh, I'm totally posting so, this one. <laughs> driving home, I have no shame. Driving home from all the big wig shows, going back to big wig, I would get tired. So I'd fucking masturbate. Okay. So one night I used to have pepper spray on my keys and with my van, with all the stickers, I couldn't get my key to work. So I'm slamming the key in, slamming the key in, slamming the key in. And I spray pepper spray all over my hands. And I'm like, fuck. So I wipe it on my pants, wipe it. I get, I get in my van, I get going, I grab a shirt, wiping my pants off. Well, it's a long ride and I start to get tired. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, Hey, there were some hot chicks at that show. Hmm, all right. So I start jerking off and there's pepper spray all over my hands and now it's all over my dick. All right. And my dick is on fucking fire. So I'm flying home, passing cars left and right. I get home, run inside the back door. Cause I, I lived in like an apartment in my parents' basement, which was pretty cool. That's why I was able to do a lot of touring. Yeah. And needless to say, I was able to take care of myself both ways. (laughs) (laughs) Washing it off and then, uh, you know, enjoying that girl that I saw at the show. I don't know. Oh, man. I can't wait for like... I'm a pervert. I don't care. I can't wait for like your son. Everybody's a pervert. They just don't want to talk about it. Your son's friends one day are going to be like, dude, we we heard his... We found this interview with your dad. He talked about pepper spraying his dick when he was jerking off in a van. He's like, huh, great. (laughs) So that's how I had to stay awake because it, it got, and you know, I didn't drink coffee back then. I'm a coffee drinker now, but I didn't, I don't know why I didn't drink coffee and all that speed, that energy that I had. Yeah. I was going to say that would have been big wig. Big wig used to think I was a cokehead. I wasn't a cokehead. I just had a lot of energy, you know? Yeah. I think if you had coffee, I think you had way more fucking seizures. Oh, I would have had more seizures. So. Jesus Christ, dude. I've talked a lot. No, this, no, of course you've talked a lot. That's the whole point of a podcast, bro. You're supposed to, you're supposed to talk and tell this many stories. This is fucking great. Um, all right. So two things before we go, uh, one, what would you like to plug? What would I like to plug? Um, I would love to plug, um, everybody in the band that I used to be with. They they were all great. We all loved each other. We all fought each other. It was a love hate relationship. Um, you know, monkey to Joanna to, we had Dawn Heiser as a tour manager. Um, you know, to the guys in the Ataris and the starting line. Great. Um, Jeremy's got red hymns. He's having that happening. Um, it was great. I was able to connect with Josh Marsh very recently. I feel bad. I'm still really close with, with uh, Castell, though. I haven't really talked to Farrell in a long time. Not in a bad way. It's life. 
I mean, as far as plugging, I, I just want to say thank you to all of them for being a part of my life. Um, and it, it was a very special part and, you know, love hate relationship. And we were all different then, you know what I mean? And I want to plug you. Fuck man. Thank you for doing this. Cause it's, it's an honor. Oh, hell yeah, man. And I'm sorry. I talked a lot. And... No, no, no. That's the, again, that's the point. This isn't like a, a, like a two song EP where you're like, why are there more songs? You can, you can edit a couple of those things, but you know, I can edit all of it. <laughs> Let the world know. <laughs> all right. So last question, what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Um, I am still vegetarian after 30 years, I'm almost 30 years in. And I learned that from hardcore music from, you know, I mean, New York hardcore taught me. And, um, yeah, I, I, I made fun of my friends and I'm like, that's stupid. Why would you do that? And actually one day I'm like, I'm going to stop eating meat. I never went back, <laughs> never went back. I ate fish for like a couple of years after that. And then I realized the only thing I like about fish is tartar sauce. Um, so being vegetarian is a big thing for me. Um, I wasn't straight edge. I didn't really do that whole thing. Although I love the straight edge hardcore bands and, um, just PMA positive mental attitude. Um, you know, just being positive in life, you know, and being good to people. I don't know. I'm a pretty, once again, optimistic, fun, loving person. I love life. I mean, I'm, I'm having a good time in life. I'm lucky to be alive where I am right now doing what I do. And that's, that's what I've learned from punk rock, positive mental attitude. You know, it's cheesy to say that, but it's, it's, it's real. It's legit for me. You know, that's what punk rock was. It's all, it was all an attitude and, you know, not that drunk punk shit. It was just fucking <sighs> stay strong. Uh, yeah. Thank you.